aggressively two years ago to invest in tools and technology, uh, especially from a business perspective. And why? Because the basics of Bayer Monsanto, they're going to use AI, big data, to try to disrupt and disintermediate the cooperative, the interim uh, partner. What's going to happen is online businesses like FBN or in Canada, Nutrien, are going to try to come in and say it's all about a digital platform. At Land Lakes, we invest in digital platform because we believe in omni-channel, and at the same time we invest in um, uh, answer plots, is what we call them. They're applied research plots that allow us to get base data and work <coughs> with farmers right on the acre to help them understand what will optimize production, profitable production for them. By the way, one of the other things we're trying to do with our data and analytics is work on sustainable production. We have a platform called Truterra that uses over a trillion data points and allows us to work on, um, on resilience at the farm level and improve sustainable production for the long term. But we don't have time to talk about that right today. So we'll go to that another, next time. You see this um, credit availability is part of the problem right now, and banks are de-risking their platform, their, their portfolio. That's the truth. You can see um, uh, loan requests because, again, they're looking at the cash flow. Loan requests are up, but uh, credit availability is down. And you can see this. We actually are trying to position a service, our services to expand our credit, um, uh, the credit access of our locals and our growers in our network. And we think that that's an advantage for us from a, a, from a, uh, from a services perspective. Farm increase, uh, income increase is largely driven by direct government payments this year. Now this is really an interesting thing because oftentimes when I communicate, again, it becomes a, a political issue. To me, it's, it's not a political issue, right? This is a situation where um, this is a security issue for the, national, for, for the nation, I believe, you know, investing in agriculture, our own uh, food supply, probably a good idea. Less than 2% of the population is in agriculture. We probably want to make sure we've got the right incentive structure to maintain this. Um, but you can see farm income, a lot of that has been driven by these payments that get people you know, saying, well, is a farmer looking for a subsidy? Is a farmer looking for a handout? I know of no farmers, certainly none, that want that. They want trade, they want a robust marketplace, and they want to compete. But the reality is we are in a disrupted environment for trade tariffs for other things. And so this is the reality of the situation. We'll see what this happens, but you can see farm income increase, but it's really tied to these payments. Trade matters, strength of the dollar matters. Brazilian real has been, um, uh, you know, the dollar has been relatively strong, and you can see what is happening with the tariffs. And all of us in business know this. When you lose a customer, it's hard to get the customer back. When the, the supply dynamics are redesigned, and the supply flows, it's very challenging to get it back. I understand next week, listening to, um, listening to, the, to, the, um, to Bloomberg this morning, that they're looking at next week for the Chinese delegation to come in and to sign that phase one deal. And when I'm asked about that, well, we'll see. I don't know what's involved yet, right? We'll have to see what's going to happen with, with soybeans, 60% of production for soybeans, especially here in these states and upper Midwest. We're going to China. We'll see if we can recapture that marketplace. Same for dairy. We're going to see if we can recapture that marketplace. This challenge in the Middle East is going to be a problem for wheat growers. That is a huge market for wheat growers. So we're going to see disruption. We're hoping for a normalized weather year at minimum. So these are a number of factors that I think are important when we consider the financial um, situation and the issues that are occurring. But I want to step over to what I was talking about. But this is the, that's right, one more, more slide, U.S. corn stocks to use. Again, we, are, we haven't been able to get a good number for what actually was harvested because a lot of stuff didn't get out of the field because of the early freeze. And the quality has been poor. There's been a propane uh, shortage. That means that it's very difficult to dry the corn to make it of the quality to, to use. So we don't yet know what this is, but the stocks to use a metric is one that we really follow, and we're trying to see, are we going to have exports? One of the largest corn markets is Mexico, um, thus signing of USMCA, really important. Um, so we're looking at all of these various variable stocks to use. We don't know what's going to happen there, but it's certainly one of the things that we, uh, we focus on. So what are the policy implications um, that we look at? USMCA, exports to China and Japan. Now we're saying the Middle East disruption with the wheat growers. The ag labor bill, this is an important area. 
you know, probably 50% of the labor that's involved um, in agriculture, and, and especially in dairy, is, uh, you know, they're immigrants. And by the way, it's not because they're, the farmers aren't paying enough. You know, the actually increase in wages has outstripped increase in wages in other areas, but the fact is nobody wants to do the job. That's the truth. So we have to come up with solutions. Um, we've got a policy position that's coming in through the business roundtable on uh, supporting um, you know, expansion of H2A uh, visas for ag workers. This is an important area and critical for farmers um, from a, a production perspective. And then the Farm Bill implementation uh, um, continues. I'm gonna, um, the last couple of slides I want to talk about the way we're thinking about this. So I've given you all the variables, the disruption. Again, I am so impressed with farmers, the original entrepreneurs, the ones that really focus on their families, their communities, the resilience, the innovation, the leverage of technology, those are opportunities. The carryover, and what I see when I'm in the country, and what we're focused on right now, are these factors. The state of rural America that should give pause to all of us. It really should give pause to all of us. And I say it is an urban issue, it's an, it's an American issue. It's not a rural issue, it's somebody else's problem. This should be all of our concern. Look at these statistics, one in four children in rural communities live in poverty. They live in poverty. Do you know how robust the backpack programs are? And it's not about what well, we need of food. I mean, they, these are real issues. They live in poverty. I, I posted that. I do a Friday fax on my Twitter feed, and somebody said, it's one in three here. It's one in three. It's not one in four. They have lack of access to medical care. Shortage of 40,000 doctors in rural America. 200 hospitals have, have closed. Medicare expansion, Medicaid expansion did not occur, so the reimbursement rates were not enough to allow for support for, um, for doctors in rural America. So how do you deal with some of these issues? We have to have technology, right? You can do telemedicine, some teleeducation. Problem is that of the 24 million Americans that don't have uh, broadband in, uh, in America, and access to it, 19 million are in rural America. We need like a 1930s rural electric initiative going across this country. It's about a $150 billion gap to close this. And it shouldn't be a jump ball between USDA and FCC and then the states are looking in the couches for pennies and quarters to try to fill the gap. This should be a priority for an infrastructure investment and it's certainly one of the things that um, we push for from a policy perspective. If you look at all these, the healthcare outcomes, nearly 45% of the heart disease deaths in rural America were deemed potentially preventable. That is because the food quality is not even there. The healthcare is not there. I, when I talk about this, I talk about rural America as the new inner city. Because of lack of investment, because of lack of focus. So yes, on all of these variables impacting agriculture, and they have a very direct imp impact on rural communities. And it is where we're spending a lot of our time from a policy perspective, in DC and in state governments, working with them, but also we're gonna to try to work on more direct action, try to think of uh, businesses that we can work in partnership with our local retailers to stand up services businesses that will allow us to close some of these gaps more directly. Fresh food delivery, partnering with somebody like an Amazon, you know, technology um, investment, <coughs> So the tutoring, but you know, these kids are being driven to a local McDonald's parking lot if they have one, or Dairy Queen if they have one, to sit there in the car with their parents so they can get enough Wi-Fi to finish their homework. It's simply unacceptable. It is unacceptable. And so it's not that somebody isn't trying, it's just not enough. We know that. And so what we are advocating for is a, a connection, and part of that is a broadband initiative. There isn't one under the FCC right now. It's, uh, it's just started. Our Chief Technology Officer, Teddy McKelly, is the chair of that commission, of that, uh, commission there. But we're going to see, because I still believe it's a bit of a jump ball. Nobody's in charge. So we're going to have to see how we can have that transform. I appreciate the, the administration, um, uh, Commissioner Pye, um, and everybody's focused on this, but we're going to need to really focus on this more broadly. 150 billion versus the 28 billion. Connection matters, and I like to remind people we have a shared destiny between rural and urban. 19% of the population lives in rural America, and they comprise 44% of the military. They are willing to make the investment in their communities and in our country, 
and we must make an investment in their communities. And it's not a handout, it is about the strength of America, it is about the strength of our nation and our food supply. And so we have to invest in rural America, so if we don't do that in the next number of years, we will lose rural America. The towns are rolling up on us, that is the truth. And we don't want that. So we have to have investment, and that's what we advocate for. Federal Reserve support, is critical, and I believe you know monetary policy, um, low interest rates, stability land prices, all of these are fundamental, fundamental, and that has allowed others to hang on for a longer period of time. We're of course looking to say what is the policy going forward. Low interest rates are critical, we know that. Stability and land prices is critical so they can get loans against that. My final comment, you know, collective call to action. Our approach, we're trying to build awareness for these challenges especially at the need for technology in these rural communities. Um, build advocacy. We want anybody who wants to get on the boat. We need advocacy at the policy level, at the federal level, at the state level, and then take action. Policy, a business direct, which is what we're working on. I think that the, the optimistic part of me says one of the great things is every time I talk about this, people say, I just didn't know. I want to help. How can we do that? Or I have a number of people in audiences like this, especially when we're in the um, upper Midwest, say, you know, I, I grew up in this town, and I went back, and you know, you're right. It's not funny, like I'm in the country, and I lost my cell signal. This is an everyday occurrence, and we need to invest. It is critical for the long-term health of um, these rural communities. So thank you. So Beth, there's a lot. Uh, we visited with each other a few months ago, and yes. we had about an hour, and we could have gone three hours or something. Yeah, you were, you were great. Um, the interest. So let me start by, you know, when I travel around our region, a lot of the topics that you touched on are front and center of people's lives. So I go to rural communities, and they say, what's going to happen to the future of our city? What do we do? Uh, our young people are leaving. They go away to college. Uh, and I get it why the broadband is actually essential, because what I say to them is what you want your young people, a lot of times what they're hoping for is the young people go away to college, they get married, they want to come home to start a family, because they, that's, that's where they feel comfortable, they want to raise their family in the town that they grew up in, but there are no jobs, right. so they can't do it. So I, I completely understand why broadband is Right, there's essential. no entrepreneurs going to start a business in, in these communities if they don't have technology access. Somebody told me the other day, like 90% of the data, which is a huge amount of data, that has been uh, developed and captured has been in the last three years. Think of that pace of change and the inability to take advantage of the data and the new tools if you have no technology access. I mean, it's crazy. But I'm wondering, so I, I'm with you on, I think that as a country, we just need to make the decision. This is a priority. It's like everywhere in the country you get access to the mail. Right. Everywhere in the country you get access to electricity, you should have access to broadband. So I'm 100% with you on that. I'm just wondering though, it seems like these economic forces are even bigger than that, that this is a trend that's been going on for 100 years. There, economists call it agglomeration benefits, where you come to a city because you have more theaters, and you have more parks, and you have more people, and then as more people leave rural communities, then you can't sustain the community bank. You can't sustain the hospital. And so I'm just wondering, even if we get widespread broadband, is that going to be enough to stabilize the situation? Or is this just are these just bigger economic forces at work? Well, I think it's both and I don't know that it's an either or because the reality is you're, you're right. Um, this is a new and, and really the advent of technology and the investment is really accelerated over the last 10 years. I mean, yeah. when, when did the phone come and now suddenly that thing has got everything on it, right, that you can need, the iPhone. Um, so you're, you're right. Now, will it be enough? Well, what I know is that, um, you know, Americans and that some of these folks in these communities are pretty innovative. So let's talk about it. There are a lot of people who want to live in their community, right? This is not a, I want to go to the coast, where all these people are. They like their way of life. They like their town. They want to be in a small town. We have to provide them access. Will it help and completely resolve the issue? No. Will it be an enabler, however, for those who want to come in and live in a robust, vibrant rural community? It will be an enabler, because it closes some of the gaps, or it allows for some closure of some of the gaps on medicine, on education, 
you know, on, on financial services. All of those, you're right, because banks are closing in local areas as well. So it, it's a really good point because there is pressure on there. But what we know is if we do nothing, right. you know, that is going to be the momentum case and that's what's going to happen. But if we do something, um, that you know, we can, we can point to a number of communities. Saw a, a great story in the Atlantic on West, in West Virginia that invested in technology through a cooperative, and now they have customer service that they're providing for a city for a business in the city. It's better, it's um, more economic for the business, and it's more and it's better um, employment for the folks in that community, and it turned the community around. Great, thank you. So let's shift gears a little bit, but related. You talked about land prices. So as a as a reserve. <coughs> We focus on the ag sector, it's an important part of our region. We're focusing on banks' exposure to the ag sector as well. And the fact that land prices have held, held up has been a really important thing that we're watching. It's been surprising, it's been really important. And you talked about how there's consolidation going on. Is, it, is most of the consolidation within farmer to farmer, or are you seeing, are there outside investors that are stepping in and buying up? Because I'm, I'm surprised the land prices have not adjusted more, given how long the low commodity prices have been with us. You know, a lot of farmers are also leasing the, you know, the excess space. Like I said, if 60% of the um, land is owned in Iowa by, by widows, you know, it's out their, their land. Um, I haven't seen directly, I don't say that it's not the case, but I haven't seen directly that outside forces are coming in and acquiring the land. It's been more farmer to farmer um, or, you know, um, you know, investor in the sector to investor. I haven't seen... Um, necessarily outside, you know, some, somebody from a foreign country coming in uh, at a level of or at a rate that I would say is it's concerning. Now, that doesn't mean that that hasn't happened, but I don't think that that's the primary issue. What I see more is that folks will either lease their land and hold it, and they'll use it, um, uh, you know, to, as a base for loans, or they'll um, or they'll uh, sell it to um, somebody else in the sector. Is your expectation that land prices will probably be sustained going forward? It's hard to know. I know. I know. It's hard to know. Um, you know, what happens is, you know, you see a more of a frequency of selling, and then you can start to see what's pricing in the market, right? We haven't seen that. We haven't seen an increase, so I haven't seen um, things come down. I was, I've been surprised too, favorably surprised that they've held up re relatively well. Um, if interest rates really start to rise, if um, the amount of liquidity, the adult capacity for loans and operating loans uh, declines. I think you're going to see more that will be challenged and we'll have to make a change. But we haven't seen a huge amount of land move. Um, we do see some, however, and go back to the bankruptcy slide, you see some folks in bankruptcy. And by the way, that's a reminder that if you go back to, sorry, a little bit of Fed history, you go back to the history of the Fed and why the Fed was created, it was in large part created, or at least part of it was, farmers getting access to capital right. to be able to plant crops. And the fact that that capital was trapped in New York and was not spread out around the country. So the Congress said, let's create this distributed Federal Reserve system so all of our communities could get access to the credit mm -hmm. So let me shift one more uh, topic quickly, which you touched on, and then we'll, we'll open it up uh, to the audience, is immigration. You talked about how important it is for the workforce, uh, for the farm community. What do you think, I mean, it seems to me when I meet with people on both sides of the aisle, on the rural broadband issue, there's a lot of agreement. Mm -hmm. Anybody who studies this for about five minutes says, you know, we seem to do this. But also on immigration, we really need to feed, you know, when Senator Johnson uh, was here from Wisconsin, pretty conservative Republican, he was talking about how immigration is vital to our workforce and our economy. It seems like most people agree with that on both sides of the aisle. So what do you see as the prospects of us coming together and doing something? Well, I mean, the administration um, and the, uh, the Congress have got a couple of uh, bills that are out there to expand maybe a pathway to citizenship. That's always the big issue, pathway to citizenship. Uh, for farm workers, uh, you know, the visas, especially for dairy producers, because that's a 24-7, 365 business. Some of them are seasonal labor um, visas, and that's just not going to cut it. Um, you know, so there, there are some adjustments and some, some bills that are up right now. Um, you know, go back to the business roundtable. They're pushing out an immigration, a position on immigration. I would say that there's more favorable conversation. Now, I'm going to be a realist here. We're in an election cycle. And this gets to be, you know, kind of a fraught conversation. Um, I don't think anybody disagrees that we need labor. Um, and certainly in the tech sector, they say we want to we want to continue to have the tech workers that have been educated here here. We want to you know think of what is it forty percent of the CEOs in that sector came from a different country. Um, so it's not that that is not 
necessary and people see it, but it gets to be an emotional, political issue. Um, I want to be optimistic about progress. I see some, some bright lights. Um, I'm not a, a, you know, a forecaster of whether that will actually pass, and I feel like if we're in an environment right now, especially this year, that it may be more challenging to have things pass. Well, let me ask one, I, was gonna, I said that was the last question, but let me ask one more question, which is, <laughs> uh, how is, uh, how is Land Lakes doing in terms of hiring the talent that you need? I like that you ask us that every quarter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, Neil does a great job. He did come to an so I really appreciate your approach. You know, it's really impressive um, where you're trying to get on the ground information. Listen, um, well, the Twin Cities is a particularly challenging um, city because there's so many great, com great companies here, right? So you better be on your A game to attract people here in the cities. But of course, we're a big business. We have about 10,000 employees. We're around the country. Um, so how are we doing? It's a challenge. Right now, um, unemployment is low, and it's especially ch a challenge in particularly hot areas like analytics, data, you know, engineering, um, on the line workers, if you're a, a maintenance guy or a or gal or a, a production technician who has that kind of technical capability, it's very difficult to hire and retain. Um, so, I mean, really what it does is it pressures the businesses to say, you've got to make sure that your incentive packages are appropriate, that um, the culture of the organization is favorable and, and some, a place where people want to build a career. But it's, it's challenging. Um, it is one of our biggest challenges when people say, what is your biggest concern? I say, you know, always the safety of our employees is the biggest primary issue for me. And then our employee base, you know, making sure we have a robust employee base. Great. Well, I know folks in the audience have a lot of questions, so why don't we start out. we got some microphones. Just raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Please wait for the mic, just so people on the on the internet can uh, hear your question before well, give Beth a chance to answer. Right in the back. Um, I'm George Charco. I'm with Cargill, your George. cousin down yes. the way. Um, we always say it's you know triple A ball over there at Cargill, and you have the big leagues here. That's a well, that's, okay. <laughs> uh, you, you talked about scale and and also alluded to the strength of niche producer. And, um, you know, one of the social issues we think about is this, um, this issue of trust, consumer trust in their food supply or, and the lack thereof. Um, and A, I'm curious if you feel insulated from that as, as being member owned and being able to tell that story. And B, what do you see how do you think about the challenge for the egg and food industry, and how does it, how should it respond uh, to regain that trust? You know, such an important question, and thank you um, for asking that. You know, um, there are a couple things that happens again because there there gets to be a narrative that happens on social media. Then if there's confirmation bias, right? Because we're only listening to the places that you know we're comfortable with or kind of in line with us. Um, I don't know broadly that people don't trust the food supply, but they have a lot of questions. I think that's great. We did this consumer panel. It was really interesting in our last annual meeting. I told them, uh, our members were in, I said, you're going to be very uncomfortable. You're going to hate this. This is why we're going to do this. We're going to have a consumer panel. They're going to come up there. These are people literally off the street. And we're going to ask them how they make, who they trust, how they make decisions. Because you need to hear this. You need to hear this and get in the game and have the engagement. And you know, it was fascinating you know, what they, they said, but what they said um, was they do trust the farmer. No matter the size, they do trust the farmer. And that's, that's great. Do we feel insulated? No, I think you'd be naive to feel insulated. Brands are important but, uh, as well. You have to show up and evidence that you have concern for the environment, that you have concern for your workers, that you want to have a quality product. And so we spend a lot of time not, um, on investment in our, um, our Trutera platform, our sustained platform, our sustainable production, and working directly with, um, with farmers and with governments. We're, in, we're uh, endorsed by the Environmental Defense Fund. We're working on the Gigaton Challenge. So all those things that are really primary to consumers right now. Um, and then in terms of regaining it, you know, what happens is innovation happens in the marketplace. I always get the question, what are you going to do about plant-based and cell-based? and you know, I'm like, you do you, I'm having a burger. I mean, great, you do you. Um, the, the reality is that's a small part of the food supply. 
we are going to see innovation and it is going to pressure messaging and that happens because of this open um, social networking that, that uh, conveys uh, messages that may or may not be based in truth or fact. What we have to do is consistently message what is the truth, what is true sustainable production, what is really healthy, and then, um, and then uh, show up that way in the marketplace so that we're consistent with our brand. We spend a lot of time making sure that what we're messaging is close to our values and close to what we see, and, and then we'll see where consumers go. Broadly, consumers are always looking. They are willing to change now. They're willing to make changes, and we should get excited about that. That really um, puts a focus on innovation. Hi, I'm, I'm Adam Bells from the Star Tribune. Hey, Adam. How's it going? So I'm, I'm curious, how sustainable do you think corn and soybean farming is in the long term? You know, given more than a third of our corn goes to ethanol, and, uh, and you know, the, the massive amount of subsidies that go to corn and soybean farming, with very little subsidy going to, you know, smaller, more, like, different kinds of farming. What do, you, what do you think are the long term problems? Well, the incentive structures have to move, you know, and consistent with what outcome we're looking for, right? So, if, you know, uh, farmers can be part of the, the, um, the solution when it comes to carbon capture, for instance, on the acre for climate um, challenges. How sustainable? Well, ethanol is important, exports are important, trade is important, right? So, what do I think of the long term? I say that we have to look at what is the change in um, incentive structure still. Uh, we do see uh, emerging markets where corn and beans are really critical. Um, I don't see tomorrow that this is going to change. I do say that what we would want to support is innovation that we're saying, and it's not just at the niche level, but other innovation for other, um, pro for other products or other things that you can grow. I mean, biodiversity is a concern issue. We were out South by Southwest looking at the destruction of biodiversity, and thus the use of different plant um, types to support food production. We'll continue to look at that, what is healthiest. When, when you say, how sustainable is it for the long term? Do I think next year we're not going to need corn and beans? No, I do not think that. We have to look at policy decisions. We're constantly measuring that and then saying um, to our farmers and to our members, these are the things that you should be aware of. Opportunities, opportunities, not challenges, opportunities to continue to farm and grow your business. And we'll see uh, what the pace of change is. It's like, you know, that question reminds me of the question of what do we think about the energy markets, right? When is oil not going to be necessary? When are we going to go all electric and things like that? And we all know that there's going to be a pace of change here. Um, and we're going to we're gonna have to see what that looks like and what the, um, what the speed is. Hi, my name is Ben. I'm a researcher at the Department of Human Services. I work on public assistance programs with support cash support. Um, so I connect with a lot of job centers and employment service organizations in rural areas, <laughs> and they often talk about constraints on uh, child, child care, transportation, and trying to help participants get jobs. So I'm curious more about the labor practices of farms and the skills they're needing, and like why there can't be the connection between these people who are very low incomes and their jobs. I know there isn't, there, people don't tend to go to those jobs, but how can we lower those constraints to get people to want to take them? No, it's such an important question. I wish they would go to those jobs. Um, but it's hard work. It's 24-7 in dairy production, right? You're milking the cow, you're out there. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. And I think even if I look at our feed mills, for instance, sometimes we have a hard time staffing feed mills, even though you say, well, these are good jobs. They're high paid, they're well paid, they've got benefits. You know, long-term, the stable company, why wouldn't you? And it's because they have alternatives, people have alternatives. Uh, but as well, some of it is not sexy to people. It's, it's hard. And so you, you look up for alternatives. And, um, and so, again, go back to the, what you have to, uh, to uh, support is what is the culture of the company and what are the investments that you can make against their training and opportunity, because I think that's what people want. But it, you know, it, is a, it is a great question. You know, why, why is attrition for truck drivers, for instance, 110%? Right, because people, though my father was a truck driver growing up, and we had you know seven brothers and sisters, and he was able to support a family with that. I mean, that's not the way it is these days. So we have to come up with with um, with uh, I guess the right support programs that would allow people to say this is a great way for you to make a living and to raise your family. But right now, that's that's very difficult. 
That's very difficult. It's not a wage rate issue because farmers have increased their wages um, to match what the, the work is. You know, I had a, when I was running for governor of California, I visited strawberry farms and I met a strawberry farmer who was a Mexican, now Mexican American, but a Mexican individual came over as a <coughs> strawberry picker and he worked his way up and he eventually bought, literally bought the farm and he running the farm and he said, you need to understand my children will not do this work. Right. That's I did this work, my children will not do this work. You know, it's a, it, we see this all the time where we are big in the Central Valley of California and we have uh, uh, producers there who have had uh, immigrants on their, uh, in their operation for 30 years. You know, they've bought a house, their children have gone to school there, um, they've got a nice life, but to the point, they're investing and in make sure their education um, allows for them to do something else. Because it's hard work, that's the truth, it's hard work. And for some people, they don't see that as their best path because they don't want to do that kind of work. Hi, uh, love the butter, by the way. Um, <laughs> Vermont Creamery is also a brand we just came out with a culture book. <laughs> yeah, right. um, turning back to the broadband initiative, yep. and you mentioned that the jobs you have the hardest time filling are technology and data analysis jobs, and certainly that's not you need to land a lynx. Um, have you had any success building a coalition with, with the other major companies that have millions of, un, of unfilled jobs in technology and data you know, across telecom, technology, financial services in this room, I'm sure. Yeah, well, what, what that goes to is training, and what are you investing in, in, in from a university perspective um, for in, uh, getting uh, young people excited about going into things adults. I, I have three teenagers, and I keep thinking you know, they need to, to invest in analytics and, and um, uh, you know, data so that they can have a career um, going, going forward. You know, do we have a consortium? Well. Yes and no. I mean, everybody knows that you've got to invest in, in, um, in this in the universities or in training. You know, interestingly, two or three things that I think are relevant in that conversation, because sometimes I'd say, well, no, I'm competing with that guy for the, you know, for the staff, so no. But, you know, trade schools, I think, are important. We don't invest enough in trade schools. Um, this requirement that everybody have a four-year degree perhaps may go by the wayside. I mean, we need to continue to, to train and reinvest, because what is the, the idea that sometimes what you learned as a freshman is not as relevant as when you're a senior, right? So it's continuous learning that we need to focus on. And from that, you know, I think there's some, uh, some companies, um, I think uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, I know Jamie um, was saying that he has a number of uh, positions that he opened up, they don't require a college degree. And I think it's going to be thinking of it differently from, uh, from that perspective and then taking the responsibility from a company in partnership with the university or others to continually train them to make sure we have the bandwidth of employees that, are op that have uh, the opportunity to fill these, fill these roles for the long term. Yes. Good morning. Uh, Bill Moore, I'm with the Farm Credit System. And so as a farmer cooperative, we share a lot of your values as, as well as some of your concerns about rural America. We're really focused now on much more of, a, of an urban and suburban centric society. And in just less than a generation, we've, we've removed that connection to ag production and rural communities in many cases. Um, we actually put out a, uh, we, had, we hired a researcher to do some work for us and they came back and something like 62% had said they had visited a farm in the last 12 months. And he looked at us and said, do you really think these 62% of these people have visited a farm? It's like, no, the answer is that they went to a, a pumpkin patch or a Christmas tree lot <laughs> or an apple orchard. So how do you uh, make a reconnection to the, the rural communities in order to build these initiatives when even if you look at the ag committees in Congress, they're no longer Iowa and Nebraska, they're now Cincinnati and Atlanta, and they're much more focused on the urban centers, uh, even the makeup of those committees. So from a government perspective, Neil, how do you look at that lens? And, and Beth, from a, from a business perspective, how can you create that advocacy without it just being single individual voices? Um, you know, there, it's, a, it's a real concern because again, less than 2% of the population, at least one and a half percent of the population is involved in agriculture, uh, although so many jobs are tied to, to agriculture. Um, and, and so how, do we, how are we doing it? Well, when we had that consumer panel, and I, what was interesting is the farmers said, oh my gosh, we have so much work to do. Because there was a misunderstanding of what, was it, what safe, affordable food was, what decisions they were making, all these other things. 
And what we've said is you've got to be your own advocate. I mean, you've got to get out there and tell a story. There's no magic one answer to this question, because I share your concern. People don't understand agriculture. They don't understand modern agriculture. They don't understand the use of technology in agriculture, why that should be exciting to all of us. They, they are disconnected from it, and it is about going to the store shelf. That's how they're connected. They don't even understand the, the supply of that. I don't have an answer to it other than to say we constantly are out there putting voice to it. Our mission is to try to close this gap between the farmer and retail. That's our unique platform from farmer right to retail with branded goods. So it puts us in a position, at least from a policy discussion and from a messaging position and discussion, for us to, sit, to advocate on behalf of agriculture in rural America, which is what we're trying to do, and remind people in urban and suburban areas that we have a shared destiny. We are connected. It is not somebody else's issue. This is our issue for us to remain connected to these communities, and we should want that. We want a robust rural environment. So I don't have a magic answer, because you're right. There's a population move. Not everybody, everybody's going to be on the coast. Um, but I'm excited that many people want to be in these communities. They want to be in the small town. So I think we've got time. I mean, I see a lot of hands up. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. So I will turn it over to you. Good morning. Um, I'm Jerry Miller, and I'm from a fourth generation farm in North Dakota. And I, um, this is my passion point. I moved away because I don't want to be in that boring town. But I have, uh, my three brothers are still back there. And I want to tell you a little bit about my brother Tom and what he has done. Um, Tom is in his 50s now, but he um, has expanded and he, uh, many farmers lease to him. He is not a conglomerate, but he, he has also diversified and he built apartments in Minot when that was going well. His wife is um, does appraisal. She went back to school. She travels around the state, but especially to Minot, and does that. Uh, their son, uh, my nephew, went to school um, and did two years and is now back on the farm. The other son is back, has another farm. And what I see is, um, you know, these are great people. Uh, you can trust them. I think communication is huge. There's a huge hole there in the amplification of that message. Um, those people are out there and they're hurting. Our community happens to have a pasta plant and that helps people get jobs. I mean, I like the broadband idea because, you know, call centers. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these people That's could right. do call centers. Who would be better to serve customers than someone you can understand and, to, you know, who has a lot of common sense? So I love this discussion. Um, I. Uh, I hope that there is something that can come from it, but I really think it's communication amplification of these messages to get um, to get some action. I mean, I hope everybody in this room, I, I appreciate that and thank you for the background. I hope everybody in this room takes this away and advocates on behalf of it. You know, when I'm in Chicago or New York and talking about this, what can I do? Well, I hope you go back and you ask for reinvestment in rural communities in your state that you understand and you advocate for them. Go visit, go visit a farm. Because you're, you're right, I mean, they, they deserve it, but we need advocates, we need all of you out there advocating on behalf of this investment and understanding why this connection is so critical to us. Beth, that was great, everybody, thank you. Please join me in thank you. Good morning, everybody, and I just wanted to, uh, to thank Beth again for uh, a wonderful presentation and insights on uh, rural economies, rural America, and that important role that our farmers 
uh, not only bring to the economies, but our farmers bring uh, to our communities uh, across Thanks our nation. Me, Ron. Uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to have that with us today. So my name is Casey Lozar, and I'm an Assistant Vice President and Outreach Executive at the Minneapolis Fed. And this morning, we'll be hearing from economists from each of the district states, uh, two states at, at a time. They'll be sharing their insights on the economic outlook for their respective states, as well as spotlighting uh, some industries that are particularly important uh, to their state's economy. So in your program, you'll see each of the, the speakers' bios. Uh, so we will not be doing an extended introductions uh, this morning. But I want you to be thinking about uh, questions uh, that you'll, you, you would want to pose to our speakers, to our experts. We'll have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A, and we really want this to be a back and forth uh, with, with our audience today. And again, just a reminder, we do have a couple mic runners, so, and we're streaming live, so please raise your hand uh, and pose your question once you, once you have your mic. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Barb Wagner, to the podium. Barb is the Chief Economist at the Montana Department of Labor and a good friend. Barb. I was very excited about having Beth this morning. The Wagner family has been farming in Montana for over 100 years now, and we also have family, I have family members with livestock operations in both North Dakota and a dairy here in, in Minnesota, and it's nice to hear somebody who talks about the agriculture industry as an actual industry with innovation and, and trying to increase their scale, rather than I feel like often the, the conversation about ag is about of some sort of cultural values about rural communities, like that we're still in the field cutting down our wheat with scythes or something. So it was good to see that. Um, but I'm here to talk about Montana. Um, sorry that I, where is, I'm sorry, where is the slide advance? Just the green one? This one. Thank you, sorry, technology, there you go. Um, the big story in Montana is uh, our worker shortage that we've been having. This is every conversation we have with the Chamber of Commerce, the businesses in the state of Montana, um, is about workers and finding more workers. Um, this chart shows the Montana and the U.S. unemployment rate going down um, the, from the last two recessions. Montana's unemployment rate has been about 4% since about 2015 right here, a little lower than the U.S., so we've been in this tight labor market situation for a little bit longer than the nation overall. Um, in some ways, this uh, provides really great things for workers, of course, lots of job opportunities, and we in Montana have experienced strong wage growth. Uh, Montana is the sixth fastest state for wage growth for the nation over the last 10 years. Um, with growth at 2.7%. Of course, that's very common across the, um, with North Dakota and South Dakota also beating Montana <laughs> in this metric. I think we're getting you next year. <laughs> Trying it anyway. Um, and then strong wage growth throughout the nation um, that we're starting to see as the national economy has a tighter labor market, we're finally starting to see that worker wage growth. The wage growth we've been seeing because of our tighter labor markets in Montana since an earlier time frame we've been seeing that wage growth for just a longer period of time. Um, I'm gonna skip through a couple slides here because I'm a little over on time and well, they were boring anyway, so you didn't wanna see it. Um, in Montana, we are seeing some signs that the labor shortage is slowing our employment growth and possibly our economic growth as well. Uh, this chart shows the gains in our employment and this is the number of people employed um, over the last 10 years. And then the orange line is our job openings in Montana. So the demand for workers continues to grow, but we're not seeing um, the same level of job growth in the last three years that we've been seeing in the past, despite the increase in demand, and that's simply a constraint on our supply side. Um, so that is having an impact in Montana. Um, good, good, good things, of course, in terms of workers' wages, but bad things in terms of 
businesses being unable to expand. Um, this chart is our forecast of what's going to be happening in the labor force and the unemployment rate moving forward. Um, and we do see that in about 2025, the demographics of the state of Montana change, and we start to have a little bit greater labor availability <coughs> at that time. Uh, Montana has also helped in our labor shortage by having a lot of migration from out of states. In fact, we're the only uh, ninth district state that has positive net migration. That's that's a that's a pretty significant. Um, we get about 38,000 people moving into the um, part of into Montana, and about 30,000 moving out. So that's net migration about 8,000. I know that doesn't sound like a lot of people, but it actually is. That's about how much our job growth has been in the last few years. So this increase of migration from people from out of state has really been fueling the the employment growth that we've had. Um, so definitely constrained labor markets. Of course, the in migration we get in Montana is a lot of people who are coming to Montana for the uh, lifestyle that we have, and it is actually making our state younger. The in migrants tend to be more educated than the uh, Montana population currently, and also tend to be younger. So this has changed our demographics. I also like to um, include this slide is maybe a little bit of lobbying that um, next year maybe the conference could be in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> Um, by the way, this is actually showing the new chair at Big Sky Mountain, which is eight skiers on it. I haven't ridden it yet, but I'm looking forward to doing it later this year. Um, our GDP growth in Montana has been a little bit, um, I would say, volatile quarter to quarter in the last few years, and this is because of some changes in the ag sector and in the energy sector, which we are talking about a little bit um, earlier in, you know, this goes back to 2014, and in 2014 and even prior to that, Montana and the U.S. Um, were more stable in their GDP production in each quarter, and then as we move past, um, when we start to have the impacts of both the coal industry right here in 2016 and 17, and then also ag um, tariffs, both of those industries have very inconsistent GDP production, and that has made Montana's GDP production also very volatile quarter to quarter, making it very hard for us economists to forecast things. However, on an annual basis, Montana is still doing quite well um, in terms of GDP production, and we continue to do fairly well overall. However, um, agriculture, I mentioned, has been one of the causes for some instability in Montana. Um, between 2016 and 17, we had a 30% drop in our real GDP from this sector. Um, I know we've already heard a lot about agriculture <coughs> and some of those things that are causing that with the lower prices, um, so I'm not going to dwell on that, um, but focus mostly on the macroeconomic impact. It was a 30% drop in our GDP, but overall agriculture makes only about 5% of our GDP. It's right here in this, here's ag and forestry. So certainly it isn't um, that drop in GDP hasn't sent the state as a whole into turmoil or anything. We're still doing well with all of the growth in our other <coughs> industries, particularly in the um, professional services industry. Montana has a very fast growing tech sector in the Bozeman area that has been doing very well and adding a lot of income to our state. However, for the counties that are highly concentrated in agriculture, this loss in GDP has been pretty significant and has slowed our economic growth a lot. This uh, chart shows what the agriculture GDP is of a percent of your total GDP across the ninth district states. Um, so you can kind of ignore the blue and the gray. It's the green counties that are interesting. Um, if they're light green, that means that they have more than 10% of their GDP is coming from agriculture. Uh, just for comparison purposes, uh, roughly 2% of the nation's GDP comes from agriculture. It's about two and a half here in Minnesota. North Dakota and South Dakota are much higher at 10%. Um, so having 10% or more of your GDP coming from agriculture is pretty highly dependent on that one industry. And some of these with the darker green counties are those that get over 20%. In fact, there's one county that goes up to 75% of their GDP from agriculture. 
So while that um, impact of the agriculture overall has been pretty um, low in terms of the state level impacts, it has really impacted local counties. Um, this is a, I also wanted to highlight a recent study that was published by the National Bureau of Economic Research just last month that researched <coughs> the impact of the tariffs on other industries in these rural communities. And this researcher found that in the counties that have been highly impacted by the tariffs, um, there was significant consumption drops of roughly 5%. So that has been impacting the other industries within these rural communities as well. And then a 1 to 1.5 uh, slowdown in job growth that they estimated with that. Uh, um, this study was uh, focused on Iowa, and so it may or may not be fully uh, relatable and generalizable to other populations, but it is the most um, recent study I saw on this topic. Um, we're going to skip over that one too. So as I mentioned before, um, whether or not that uh, ag GDP shows up in your overall state's economy, I just wanted to show some of the impacts on the other uh, states, and this is at the full state level for Wisconsin and Michigan. And while Montana's GDP did have that 30% drop in 2007, um, it's, Minnesota and Wisconsin also had some impacts, but the other states are showing stronger. I think this, in some ways, is more interesting from a political discussion perspective of if this, if the impacts of the tariffs have not been obvious in every single state and in every single community. I think that changes the political discussion about um, the outcomes of the trade wars and how that has impacted our communities. Um, back to Montana for a little bit. Um, oh, oh, did you notice my other lobbying that we might? Oh, there we go. There we go. Just in case you wanted to come. Um, so Montana is a very diverse state. We're pretty big. And what drives our economy is significantly different on the western portion of our state than the eastern portion. Um, and these are two areas of the state. The southwest, um, which includes the town of Bozeman that I mentioned is having a very strong growth in the tech sector now. And then also the northeast, which is Missoula and Kalispell, are, have been growing pretty rapidly exiting from the recession and have had very strong growth. However, the more ag-dependent and energy-dependent areas of our state have not had as much growth. Um, the North Central is highly dependent on ag, and that has been pretty, well, hasn't been performing great, right? And then South Central includes a lot of coal mining and had some slowdowns of growth when we had lower coal prices here in 2016 and 17. And then Eastern Montana follows a pattern that I think our North Dakota economists will recognize very well, really with the growth driven by the energy boom in um, Eastern Montana with the Bakken, huge growth and now is coming down um, after that. Still some um, positive growth from the overall development though. Um, and I wanted to include this chart also to talk about our reservation areas in the state of Montana. We have seven reservations and they um, are, I think, fairly, they have a lot of impact in Montana um, because of, they take up a lot of our space in the, like not take up a lot of our space, I suppose, but they do have a pretty large impact on our overall economy and in the regions around that. Um, in particular, uh, the Crow Reservation and Northern Cheyenne Reservations have been <coughs> impacted by the closure of the coal strip power plant and the impacts in coal uh, with decreased coal revenues. It has been very challenging for these two um, reservations because so much of their tribal revenues were dependent on coal. And so it's not just the drop in the coal industry itself, but also a drop in the tribal government revenues which you know, then they needed to cut some of the government in um, employment and other uh, providing other services. So we had a spike up. The Crow Reservation actually spiked up to 20% unemployment um, in the last several years, and it's thankfully back down to 14% now. Um, but as we move forward with the closure of the, a major coal-fired power plant in Montana, this will be an area of um, impact that we're watching. I'm going to skip over that one too. Um, I spoke about the coal strip power plant. Um, the coal strip power plant is the largest coal-fired power plant on the, 
the Montana side of the Missouri, Mississippi River. It makes up roughly about half of the power that we produce in Montana, and Montana is a pretty large exporter of power. So it is kind of an important uh, discussion in our overall economy and our output, particularly in our exports. Um, the part of the plant has closed down in January. Uh, the rest of the plant is still kind of uncertain in what will happen. There is significant environmental impacts from this plant. Um, so there's two different questions that are really kind of something that we need to be answering in the Montana economy in the next few years. And one is, how do we make up that power in terms of exports? How do we encourage that energy development to make use of the resources we have in terms of the transmission lines and the workforce? And then the second part of this, the local community will be do, uh, going through a lot of restoration in the next few years. So there are job opportunities in environmental cleanup for the workers who have been working in the coal mine and the power plant. So that will be a nice way to kind of minimize the impact of this. But because these restoration plans are not yet finalized, it's hard to know what the impact of the overall closure is going to be on the larger economy. So um, that's my takeaway points today. We are doing pretty good. We're having nice uh, wage gains in Montana, which is really something that our economy needs. But we do have some challenges coming up. What's going to be happening to the agriculture tariffs is one of those challenges. And also, um, there's still some remaining questions about what happens in our coal industry. Um, it, but overall, that the what's happening in Montana is, our, I mentioned two industries that are more traditional industries that are kind of having challenges, but the rest of our economy is actually growing really well. And overall, that means that Montana is transitioning to more knowledge-based um, economy versus more um, industrial and agricultural economy overall. So, thank you. Barb, uh, for a great presentation, I'm sure your uh, your your boss would be very excited about pitching to the, a full room to bring people out to the state of Montana. So, thank you for your presentation. Uh, next up, I'd, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Mark Twasney from South Dakota to the podium. Mark currently serves as the state economist for the South Dakota Bureau of Finance and Management. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me here. So yeah, as Casey mentioned, uh, Mark Wozni is the uh, state economist for South Dakota. In that role, I work in the governor's budget office, uh, work on modeling the, the economy for South Dakota as it relates to uh, estimating uh, tax revenues for the state. Um, so the way we kind of look at employment and, and wages is going to be you know a little bit through that lens. <clears throat> The governor uh, rolled out her proposed budget just last month uh, for the state of South Dakota. Uh, we modeled the economy going out to, to 2021 because uh, we're estimating revenues for fiscal year 2021. Uh, you know, I know the focus of this is kind of looking at 2020. I included that data uh, for our model in 2021, but I'll keep my comments focused on, on 2020. I'm going to start off uh, high level, um, looking at a couple of points that we like to track um, for the state's economic health. And so this is this is real GDP in, in billions of dollars here. Um, between 2010 and 2018, um, GDP grew at an average rate of 1.8% in South Dakota. Uh, we can see that, that we had a little bit of negative growth um, in, in 2017, and I think we kind of talked about the economy and the, and the challenges we've seen there. I'll touch on that a little bit more here uh, later. Um, when we did this forecast in October, looking out to 2019, at the, what, what the rest of 2019 was going to look like in 2020, 2021, uh, you know, we've had, we estimated 2019 ending at 2.7 percent, and then 1.8 um, percent in 2020, and 2 percent in 2021. Uh, you know, we did this estimate September, October timeframe. I think anecdotally, a lot of the data has come in been um, better, and so we're kind of excited to see what what it looks like when when uh, we, we look at it. So looking at, at non-farm income, about 63% of South Dakota's tax revenue comes from our sales and use tax. Uh, we have a broad-based sales and use tax, uh, but we don't tax a lot in, in the egg sector. Uh, you know, obviously an egg-dominated state, uh, 
we try to support that as much as possible. So um, looking at non-farm income is a pretty important metric for us to understand what consumers are going to have to spend. Um, annual growth from 2010 to 2018 was average approximately 4.3% um, um, in South Dakota. Uh, we've had a really tight labor market for quite a while in South Dakota, uh, like the rest of the country, and we've been a little bit stumped why we haven't seen stronger growth uh, in incomes and wages. Uh, you know, we've had sporadic growth, um, particularly 2012, 2014 were good years, but 2013 was actually a negative year. Um, 2018 came in at 5.4%, um, you know, so that was a good number for us to see. We're a little more cautious looking forward into 2019 and 2020, uh, you know, 4.1% ending the year in 2019 and then uh, looking at 4% uh, in 2020. So this is a chart that we like to look at. South Dakota obviously has a large egg sector. Um, we do have one area that we have focused uh, uh, tax revenues um, from, and that's that we have an excise tax on farm machinery sales. So, you know, we talked earlier about 2017, we had negative real GDP growth. Uh, we've talked a lot about it here. We can see our, our farm uh, economy, farm income bottomed out in, in 2017, and that's what led to that uh, negative uh, real GDP growth that we saw there. Um, we've seen some recovery. You know, the red line here on the right-hand scale, that's our estimated tax on that farm machinery. Uh, we've seen some good recovery in that. And uh, in 2019, so far, it looks like it's, it's still going. I don't have uh, an estimate for that, though. <clears throat> so next, I'm going to look specifically at uh, employment and wage outlook. Um, we're going to look at some data points that are included in our economic uh, model for South Dakota, and then we're also going to look at some labor market information center, center data. Overall, employment and wages uh, forecast is modeling, you know, kind of what we expect for the overall economy. Strong growth in 2019 and then still good growth in 2020. South Dakota unemployment rate, it's uh, historically low, historically been lower, one of the lowest in the country. Um, we can see, you know, we recovered from uh, Great Recession uh, levels of about 5%. Um, we're uh, forecasting 2019 to end at, at about 2.88% uh, unemployment. As we move into uh, 2020, we're forecasting on an annualized basis to be at about 2.74%, and 2021, 2.6%. So getting back to the, the pre-recession um, bottom that we had in unemployment rate um, going into 2021. Uh, so, uh, in terms of employment numbers, uh, you know, we've seen pretty good growth in the number of workers, averaging 1.1% uh, uh, between 2010 and 2018, and recovering our pre-recession uh, levels in 2016, and, and then just adding um, from there. You know, as, as Barb talked about, and, and Beth this morning talked about, uh, workforce is an issue that we hear and speak about very frequently in South Dakota. We have a number of programs that, you know, seeking to increase. Uh, workforce, both by keeping people in state and then trying to attract workers from out of state. You, you might have heard about a recent uh, uh, campaign that South Dakota did related to meth. That's not our first kind of foray into uh, interesting uh, advertising techniques. You might remember a few years ago uh, when a lot of people were signing up to go to Mars, South Dakota uh, ran an ad campaign that says, why go and die on Mars when you can come and live in South Dakota? <laughs> so, <laughs> we like to make headlines with our advertising campaign. Yep, it's still going. Yep, it's still going. Yep. So uh, if, if you haven't heard, South Dakota, um, you know, we've got a meth problem. I think regionally there's a meth issue going on. And um, uh, we came out with a campaign that says, meth, we're on it. Uh, I think it's kind of duly meaning, obviously, it catches a little tongue in cheek there, but also trying to say, hey, we need to focus on this issue. Everybody needs to focus on this issue and tackle it. So, yep, meth, we're on it in South Dakota. <laughs> but it seems that these programs are working. Seems maybe the Art Mars ad uh, worked. I know um, uh, Barb kind of showed us here a. Uh, a a slide that showed uh, net in migration was negative in, in South Dakota. Uh, we look at IRS data, which is a little bit different, and so what that's showing us is that we're actually a, a positive net in migrator, uh, and, and the migration that is occurring is in higher wage jobs. So um, in 2017, which is about the best we have, it's about a thousand jobs. I know that's not big numbers for, for the rest of the region, but it's a pretty good number in, in South Dakota. <clears throat> Especially in the context of you know what we're adding, 
2019, we're expecting to be a really good year, 7,800 jobs or 1.8% growth. Uh, looking to 2020, again, you know, moderate, uh, adding 2,600 jobs or about 0.6%, and a similar number in 2021. So, <clears throat> kind of moving to the, to the wage side of the equation, um, you know, we talked about calling for a neutral farm economy in 2020, and that's gonna carry over in real per capita personal income. You can see, you know, we're pretty flat in, in, uh, from 2019 to 2020. We're you know, expecting good growth in 2019, but uh, flat going forward. And that's, we're just not projecting any major disruptions in the egg sector. And so that's what's kind of coming through on this chart. <clears throat> Trying to get more focused in on, on wages. Uh, in our forecast, we forecast non-farm personal income, and this is on a per capita basis here. Um, <clears throat> We're forecasting growth of, of about 4% in both 2019 and 2020, which comes out to an increase of about $1,800 in, in, in each year. So a pretty good growth uh, for South Dakota there. <clears throat> Trying to understand what's, what's driving that growth. Um, we'll look at some labor market information set data. So this, this chart here, um, at the top, that's total employment. We've got the estimated <coughs> employment in 2016, and then uh, a projection uh, 10 years out from that. At the top, all of South Dakota. The next five uh, categories are the top five gainers in South Dakota, and that's the black. And then the red are the bottom five uh, categories for this group. So looking at this chart, we can see you know four of the top five are uh, sectors that have an average wage above the 2018 weekly average wage. So we're seeing really strong growth in high wage positions. You know when we look at uh, uh, consulting services and professional scientific and tech services as consulting services. Healthcare uh, is a big one. Management, you know, obviously seeing growth in good jobs. Um, at the bottom here, you know, ag is, is still growing uh, at, at more of a kind of normalized rate for the whole state. Uh, and then we only have one negative growth area that we're expecting, and this is kind of what we're seeing in the, the information center that's going to be related to the movement <laughs> of publishing from, you know, like a print publishing to online, and so that's kind of driving that. So overall, you can see uh, we're seeing good growth in um, high wage uh, jobs, and then looking at healthcare, which when you, you can see we start, that's our, our largest sector by far uh, in terms of number of employment, and that's got a good double sector, double um, digit growth. And that, that serves as a good segue into our sector spotlight. <clears throat> Now, uh, I'm sure some of you are probably wondering why the guy from South Dakota is here uh, highlighting the healthcare sector. Uh, you know, why not ag or financial services or maybe manufacturing? Those are the things that we think of when we think about South Dakota. And, and you know, those are uh, important parts of our um, sector or of our employment. But I think another thing that, that isn't really seen or talked about in South Dakota is our healthcare sector. South Dakota serves as the, the headquarters to three large healthcare companies. Avera on the top left there, that's our, going to be the state's largest employer with over 12,000 employees in the state. <clears throat> the company also operates facilities in Minnesota, North Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska. So a regional employer and regional um, company that's headquartered in South Dakota. Sanford Health is a global health care provider with locations throughout the five states that Avera serves with additional health care clinics in Oklahoma and California. And then internationally has healthcare clinics in China, Ghana, Germany, and Canada. And then the company also recently acquired the Good Samaritan Society. So now offers, uh, uh, has senior living facilities in 26 states. Overall, that company employs 48,000 people worldwide. So a large company that's headquartered in South Dakota. Monument Health here, it's gonna be the, the the smallest of the three, and its operations are focused in the western, more sparsely populated uh, part of the state, as well as eastern Wyoming. The company employs about 4,500 people, mostly in South Dakota. Uh, but big news for that company, it used to be called Regional Health. Recently, they're going through rebranding, and they um, announced that they're going to be um, partnering with the Mayo Clinic here in Ross Register. So good, good news for them. <coughs> So looking at our model, what's included in our model for health services and employment, uh, between 2010 and 2018, category averaged 1.6% growth, about half a percentage point better than, than overall employment growth uh, per year. Growth is projected to be 2.3% in 2019 and then 1.5% both in 2020 and uh, 2021. So that's about 1,500 jobs in 2019, 1,000 jobs in 2020. 
chart here gets a little busy, has lots of colors, um, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, uh, shows health services employment annual year over year growth versus total non-farm employment growth. So on the left, in the gray and the dark blue, that's gonna be our year over year growth <coughs> health services. And then on the right, the right bar in yellow and dark and light blue is, is total employment growth. So we can see we're outpacing generally uh, total employment growth in the health services sector every single year, except for 2014 and, and 2015. Um, looking out to 2019, uh, good growth, and 2020, you know, we expect to outpace uh, total employment growth by about 1%. So taking a look at wages, um, our model, you know, doesn't specifically look at uh, healthcare services wage growth. It gets rolled up into a higher category. So uh, we look kind of labor market information data to, to get a, uh, an idea of what's going on with wages here. Uh, we can see that the highest growth is expected to occur in the ambulatory healthcare and uh, hospitals categories, and that those are our highest wage um, sectors in that in that grouping. Um, this chart here, also another little bit busy one, but we can see it, it breaks down in the green. We have ambulatory healthcare, blue hospitals, uh, orange social assistance, and then purple nursing and residential care. And so that's all of the the lower level groups that make up that sector. And then uh, in the yellow with the, the dots on it there, that's the healthcare and social assistance group as a whole. And then overlaid on top of that is the total growth for all wages. So this is annual growth for, for those categories by year. It looks like we've got an anomaly in the data in 2013, probably a, a, a large employer moved from one to the other and kind of showing that data. But overall, you know, we can see that the healthcare group moves in concert pretty well with total wage growth. And so, uh, you know, what we can infer from that is, you know, we, we looked at non-farm income growth. We know a big driver of non-farm income growth is gonna be wages. We, we looked at that growing about 4%. So I think we can infer that that, that would be a good expectation to have in, in 2020 for the healthcare sector as well. You know, overall uh, in 2020, we're forecasting another another strong year growth. Uh, the model, like I said, was put together in October. We're seeing some slowdowns in global growth and sentiment at that time. I think if, if we look back, think back to September, October, everyone was kind of saying, probably going to be a recession in 2020, 21. Um, I think a lot of that data has come in. It's been different. We've seen recovery. Sentiment's changed. Um, so we weren't. Uh, we're, we're hopeful about what the next one looks like. We're going to be doing another modeling in. in um, uh, here next month for our legislative session as we finalize revenues for that. Uh, as we have good data come in, we're hoping that improves. And so uh, we'll put a lot of that data out on our website there, the BFM website. I've included here and then the labor market information. And so uh, thanks for your time this morning. Thanks, thanks again, Mark, uh, for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> we've got about 10 minutes, uh, 10 or 15 minutes for some Q&A for, for both uh, Barb and Mark. And so I, I hope uh, you've been thinking about some questions to, to pose to our economists and our experts um, that just presented. Um, but I'll, I'll get us uh, kicked off here. And I, I wanted to, to ask a question to, to Barb to start, um, really reflecting on your slide about uh, net, uh, positive net uh, migration, and, and that it's, it's the highest in the district, and, and knowing sort of uh, quite a bit about the state of Montana, knowing that we're, we're looking to fill about 115,000 jobs or so in the next seven or eight years with um, some retirement of our, our baby boomers, what role is that net migration going to play in the overall strategy for the state to be able to accommodate filling those positions? So that's a good question. Um, the number Casey was referring to of the 115,000 replacements is actually the number of people in the Montana uh, labor force who are 55 and over and expected to retire in the next 10 years. Now this um, estimate actually does include the fact that older Montanans and older Americans can, are continuing to work longer. So I, it's possible that it could even be an underestimate, but that represents over 20% of our workforce in Montana. 
Um, so, and this is not a problem just for Montana. And the baby boomer population is actually global, right? And so, a lot of a um, lot of the concerns about the workforce and the labor market are about one: how do we replace those workers when our pop younger population is simply not large enough um, to help fill those positions? And also, of course, the loss of knowledge and experience that we're also having when you are, have a retiring um, older worker and replacing them with a younger worker, I think that has always happened, right? But maybe not to the extent that it's currently happening. Um, so in Montana, I, um, the migration is really key to helping fill that 20% of our workforce who are not going to be there um, 10 years from now. And it is really, I, you know, without that migration, I think that we would be in a scenario in which um, our employment growth would be significantly lower. We've been noticing the impacts of a very tight labor market on slowed employment growth for several years now. Um, and um, we would, I think that there's other signs of that tight labor market as well. Uh, Montana actually has a very high rate of part-time jobs not because we have not as many full-time jobs, but because we have more people working part-time jobs instead of not being in the labor market. Um, so there's other time, um, signs that there's some like take up of people who otherwise would be out of the labor market. Uh, but yes, that migration is key for us to continue our job growth in the future. And I mean, it, not that this is the ultimate in any economic analysis, but I don't think that's much of a coincidence that we get about 6,000 workers every year, and that's about what our job growth has been in the next last few years as well. So. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Barb. But maybe a similar question to Mark. You know, I know South Dakota uh, last year led the nation in number of workers that had multiple jobs. And that being a fact, and, and kind of looking at your projections for an additional 6,000 workers or so in total employment over the next couple of years, where, where is the state looking to sort of resource uh, workers from? Uh, yeah, thanks, Casey. I think. Um, the state is, is looking uh, internally, obviously, where we talk a lot about economic development in South Dakota. Uh, Barb, you had a great slide that showed your reservations and your prevalence of unemployment there. And we have similar issues in South Dakota, a very large uh, tribes, very high unemployment there. And that, that's an area that we're constantly evaluating. Uh, outside of those, it's, it's really, really tight labor markets. So um, people talk about uh, brain drain in South Dakota. You know, we, we try and fight against that and we think, uh, you know, as I talked about with the IRS data, people are coming in that, that make more money, you know, and so we're getting, we're getting people that come in and, and less people leaving. And so we're trying to keep the kids that are coming out of college. Uh, we don't want to export uh, workforce, and then we're just uh, constantly looking to uh, uh, our surrounding states, sorry everybody, to try and attract people. Um, you know, we have a low regulation environment trying to attract the companies and that's gonna bring in, in the workers is what we're trying to do. Keep taxes low, keep the quality of life um, high, and, and uh, that's, that's what, our, what our efforts have been so far. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mark. Do, do we have any questions? Um, we've got mics over here and over here. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, this gentleman in the back. Hi, uh, Bob Thompson from Mars and Power. Uh, you, you mentioned the taxes. Uh, I don't know if there's been a study done on the rural areas, but um, it seems like every, we're just constantly reading articles about uh, pe more people migrating to the lower tax states and away from the high tax states. Have you guys, I, I, if Beth was around, it'd be interesting to see if they've done a study you know, on Minnesota, Wisconsin, which are higher tax states versus North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana, which are lower tax states, but it, it, it sure seems to be an advantage, especially in your rural areas, if you get broadband with the lower taxes. But have you guys, have the economists studied that to see, you know, I mean, you know, it turns into a huge political issue, but is there is there a lot of studies that are just, you know, are, are people truly migrating to the lower tax states? And where do you guys consider yourselves in that in that area, I know we're in South Dakota lines. I, you know, I could take a, a stab at it. I, I guess, uh, going back to that IRS data where we, we showed us being a net uh, gainer, and, and I would say 
that's a trend that's different than a lot of northern states when you look at that same data and you look at like a state like Illinois same way from Illinois, but you know, obviously has a higher tax burden. You know, they're losing you know fifty thousand jobs a, a year um, to that. So while we haven't studied it specifically, I guess to in danger of towing the company line, low taxes and in, in, in that are are big attractor for employers and a big attractor for uh, individuals looking to keep more of what they earn. And so uh, I would say, uh, yeah, it's true. I guess we'll have to see if the data keeps kind of showing. From a Montana perspective, um, I think that we are, I mean, when you have low taxes, you obviously also provide less services. Um, and then, you know, there's also a mix of tax types. The same one state has low taxes in terms of income taxes, doesn't consider that they probably have very high property taxes in the same state. Uh, Montana doesn't have sales tax, but that does mean that our, our income taxes are slightly higher than. Some of the other states as well. So, in many terms, there's lots of trade-offs there. Um, but going back to you know when you have a tax burden that is a little higher, you're also funding better education systems, um, and you're driving a lot of um, other types of workers that come into your economy. In Montana, our the focus of our business community has been on recruiting and retaining a successful and well-trained workforce. Um, our Chamber of Commerce has been very active in net, um, putting businesses and um, community colleges, our uh, higher education systems, and even our high schools, and working with them to collaborate on getting a stronger workforce. And all of those systems and that worker training are funded through tax dollars. And so there is some trade-offs there. Um, while taxes are a concern for every single business, is, they pay, businesses will pay out more money in wages than they were, will pay out in taxes. And so while there is always trade-offs, it's important to remember that um, you know, businesses care about those education systems and the worker training systems in addition to taxes. Uh, yeah, question in the back. Right here, right here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Eskirica. I'm with United Bankers Bank in Bloomington, Minnesota. And my question, we've been talking a lot today, you've been talking a lot today about the low level of uh, unemployment, the tight labor market, the uh, nationally, the, the unemployment rate at a 50 year low, well below the Fed's natural rate of unemployment, as they, as they term it. Uh, why is inflation remaining so stubbornly low? And do you think the Phillips curve is broken or are faster wage gains just around the corner? I love this question. There's about, I would say, 50 people in this room that can answer the question better than me. Um, you know, that is, it's super interesting, isn't it? And I think someone, I mean, my focus is on the economy in Montana and not macroeconomic policy. We've been closely watching monetary policy and the actions of the, of the Federal Reserve to, and the research that are coming out from the Federal Reserve. And you guys do a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Question. I wanted to actually maybe shift a little bit to make some connection between some insights that Beth had in, in uh, the healthcare industry in South Dakota, Mark. Um, just making the assumption that a lot of the growth in healthcare has been in, in sort of the urban areas in, in South Dakota. And, and hearing from Beth this morning that there have been 120 <coughs> rural hospitals that have closed recently. What, what sort of trends do you see in, in the state of South Dakota? And maybe you can respond as well, uh, Barb, about, so where is rural health care in, in both of your states? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. You know, I tried to look at the data that's out there that's available, and I, I showed those three companies. Well, what's happened in South Dakota is that we've had a great deal of consolidation of those three companies. It's really hard to get publicly available data now because of that consolidation that's considered the number of employers is too low. Um, but, you know, I have anecdotal evidence uh, that, that says, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, issues that we see that we're seeing um, nursing home facilities closing in rural areas at, at a really high rate. That's been a big issue in South Dakota. Uh, you know, uh, some of that related to uh, reimbursement rates, uh, some of it related to uh, the population is not there anymore. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, hospitals are, are closing um, in South Dakota in rural areas. We're we're always keeping an eye on that. We're we're working to um, expand healthcare opportunities, looking to 
and we have a number of programs to get healthcare providers into rural communities and pay off a, a doctor's student student loans and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it, it seems to be uh, stemming the, the tide. We're making uh, investments in telemedicine, so I think we're seeing a shift, maybe from you know doctors and, and um, high level healthcare professionals in the rural community to you know, uh, outreach clinics that are staffed by, you know, uh, PAs or nurse practitioners and, and nurses and then uh, consulting on a telemedicine basis. And that's just the reality. It's hard to attract those people to a town of 1,000 people or 12,000 people. That's a big town in my state. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, so it's challenging, but I think South Dakota is working to meet that challenge. Um, in Montana, we did uh, pass Medicaid expansion both earlier, uh, years ago and um, just recently and that was a very critical part of funding our rural hospitals um, there is a number of rural hospitals in the association uh, said that they likely would have to close if that um, legislation had not been passed so that has helped our rural communities um, you know having grown up in a rural community boy there's a lot of struggles but I think the providers that we have in the state do an awesome job at trying to provide Healthcare services to our rural communities, in particular, um, the healthcare providers in Billings um, come up to Northeast Montana. When I, I mean, even when I was in high school, my uh, orthodontist came up from Billings once a month to type in there, type my prices, right? So uh, thanks to him for the smile. <laughs> um, and but like my parents, they fly down to Billings to get their back surgeries and their doctor's appointments and then have follow-up appointments in Glasgow in our local community hospital. So there's a great deal of cooperation there. Um, and I think um, it's a struggle, for sure. But they're very dedicated people to providing services in our rural communities in Montana. And I give them props for keeping that going. Thank you. We have time for about one more question. Um, and since I've got the microphone, I guess it's going to be me. But. <laughs> Can you stand up? Uh, actually, I'm coming off a hip operation, so if you don't mind, the, the answer is I could, but then I'd fall down. So. Uh, I've got actually two questions for the uh, lady from Montana and the coal strip uh, plant closure. Is, is that going to leave uh, ratepayers paying for on a, what they call stranded assets or unamortized? Uh, costs because we've got a similar situation going on in uh, northeastern Minnesota uh, and then for both of you at, at the same time that there's historically low unemployment and a shortage of workers in ag and other places there's persistent chronic high unemployment on the Indian reservations and uh, since the Indian reservations are in rural Minnesota, you wonder whether we've got ships passing in the night, you know. Uh, is there some kind of a cultural problem? Uh, are Native American Indians unwilling to leave the reservation to find work? Are employers in uh, the resort industry or ag unwilling to hire Native Americans? It's, you know, it seems I've been looking at that for 20 years and there's no movement. You know, unemployment on the Red Lake Indian Reservation in Minnesota is 65%. Uh, you've got uh, farmers who can't hire workers. You've got resorts that can't hire workers. I can start on that one. Uh, just briefly on the reservation issue and then moving to Coal Strip. Um, I share your concerns about these communities and some of the challenges that the economies um, present and also how do we integrate um, more with the businesses on the reservation and how do we get them into our financial systems and our um, I know that the Fed has done a lot of work on the Universal Tribal um, Commercial Code. Um, so there's lots of efforts that are ongoing to uh, do some more things to help uh, um, 
<coughs> reservation economies, but it is a challenge. That's one of the reasons I became an economist, actually, is because our family farm is on a reservation, and I grew up in a, a border community, and I saw a lot of the disparities, and you know, why? Why is this such a challenge? Um, it's, it's something that has motivated me, and I think motivates you and many others in this room, I believe. Um, as for coal strip, it's an ongoing question. Um, so there was a settlement that required one and two to close. Um, by 2022, they actually closed early because of market conditions. They closed just this month, just last week. Um, so that is about a third of the plant. Um, the other two, the 66% of the power that's in the units two and three, or three and four, are still kind of an ongoing conversation. And there's six different owners of the plant, um, and several of those owners have gotten out and paid for the entire restoration of, of the plants prior to this. We had a fairly large settlement, both for uh, the restoration fund for one and two is probably going to be over uh, 400 million at the end of that. So they are, they are the states working. The state of Washington has been working um, to provide some cleanup funds for the community. But it is a compl complex issue because it involves many different jurisdictions. It's a regulated industry and multiple different business owners. So um, is it a challenge that we're keeping an eye on? Absolutely. But I think in some ways we've done a good job of making sure the liabilities are funded. Uh, and to touch back on the, the uh, tribal areas, um, you know, I, I think all of us would say it seems like a basic equation, uh, workers that need jobs and uh, employers that need workers. You know, but obviously life's not that simple. I think you, you touched on, you know, the cultural uh, issues there. Um, you know, what we talk about in South Dakota is, is culturally relevant. Uh, economic development it's not it's not going to look like economic development does in, in non-tribal areas you know and working with uh, employers to understand that we also talk about education being really uh, important in those areas and, and working with our tribal uh, partners to, to see how we can best serve them and help them you know uh, address the challenges um, you know I don't think there's an easy answer uh, for that I wish it was just the equation but it's uh, less hard well, we've run out of time, but I did want to just, just mention that, and Barb brought it up, that here at the Minneapolis Fed, we do have uh, one of our key institutes is the Center for Indian Country Development. And, and we're asking um, uh, those similar questions around how do we uh, grow uh, our labor and, and make connections between opportunities in Indian Country with uh, a, an available workforce in Indian Country. And we're, we're excited to see some of the the work that's happening on early care and education and that role that's put, playing to prepare our young Native Americans for the workforce down the road. So um, just a little plug that you'll see, continue to see sort of sort of the research that we're doing here at the bank uh, through the center uh, and the convenings that we're having, uh, particularly with this population. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would please join me in welcoming or thanking Barb. Um, <laughs> And we are going to be taking a very, very short uh, break, uh, about an eight minute break. So if we can come back in about eight minutes, there is some refreshments over here on the side and the bathrooms are down on the hall.
Fed, and I'll be moderating our second panel, uh, which includes representatives from uh, two of our other district states, North Dakota and, uh, and from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. One sort of common bond that these two geographically disparate areas have is that they both have a long and important history of having prominent uh, natural resources and energy sectors. And so that's sort of a bit of a spotlight focus uh, that we're going to have in this second panel. Our first speaker uh, for this panel is Nancy Hoder, who <coughs> is uh, currently the director of the Center for Social Research from uh, North Dakota at uh, North Dakota State University. So if you could please welcome Nancy to the podium. For a second there, I was worried he was going to, you know, say I was from North Dakota, not North Dakota State. So we've got a little bit of a rivalry issue there, so we'll make sure we got that clarified. And if you haven't heard, we kind of have a really big football game this weekend, so we hope you all turn in. No bison. Anyway, uh, first I want to thank you for having me. Uh, I want to give some attribution to my colleagues. There were some other folks that helped me uh, pull this together because, uh, well, unfortunately, I'm not an expert in everything, albeit uh, I try. So uh, Dean Bankson, you may recognize his name, he's a long-term colleague, Dean you know, Kamishka from the Center for Social Research, and Frank Olson from the Department of Ag Business and Applied Economics. Uh, I guess I figured I should have figured out how to run this. There we go. I'm going to talk a little bit of beyond just energy, okay? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about demographics because it's been a pretty significant shift in North Dakota in the last decade. Uh, the economy has gone boom and that has now settled out. Uh, and also, uh, we're going to talk about the oil and gas industry, but I do want to, to uh, mention that the oil and gas industry is just part of a larger energy industry. I'm not going to touch on our growing wind economy, wind, wind sector, or the uh, lignite coal industry and the mining and conversion, or the uh, electricity generation and conversion that goes with it. And again, I can't talk about North Dakota without talking about agriculture. Um, Oh, my slide didn't come through exactly with. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. I like this slide just for the dramatic effect. I mean, really, if you stop and look at it, we've just been chugging along since the 1940s. And at the turn of the century and in the last 10 years, the economy's just gone. The population is, has literally just exploded in, in North Dakota. When you take a look at it since, um, oops, lost my spot here, where we've just seen dramatic growths in the last 10 years. Here's a little look at some more recent population forecasts. As you can see uh, along the, the trend line, uh, we've got a population now of an all-time high of 672,000. Uh, the dotted line that goes up to 891 by 2029, that's some work for some population projections we did back in 2015. I think those projections are a little hot. Uh, again, we were doing those projections right at the peak of the boom when things were going uh, the strongest in the oil and gas energy. I, I ran a little trend line on it from 213 out to 2029, and I think we're going to see more stable, steady population growth uh, throughout the state. I know there's some folks that are saying we can hit 800,000 uh, in the next 10 years, but I think that's a little optimistic, you know. Uh, but anyway, again, that's a good look at, at what's transpired in the last few years, and it is pretty dramatic given the history of North Dakota. Now, here's a really interesting slide. We've seen growth overall, but I tell you what, population change is not consistent throughout the state. And there's two takeaways from this slide. One is you see out in the, out in the purple out in the west, and those are our four key oil and gas producing counties. It's just gone boom out there. Mackenzie County has increased by 114%. Uh, Watford City and the county has gone from a population of about 6,000 to about 13,000 in less than 10 years. So the, imagine the, the amount of stress that's been on the infrastructure out there has been absolutely incredible. The other takeaway is that we're really seeing other areas of the state where we're not seeing population growth. Those yellow areas are predominant agriculture areas, our small rural communities. We heard quite a bit about that this morning, but we're seeing some, some uh, the trends of the past continue. The other areas of growth are in our urban areas, Grand Forks, Bismarck, Dickinson, Minot, perhaps not so much uh, uh, Grand Forks, but those economies are much more diversified, much more stable, and are growing pretty consistently. 
There's another big takeaway. We have gotten much younger. We're the fourth youngest state in the country. Um, and that, again, is a dramatic shift in trends uh, over the course of the, the last few decades. Uh, so you can see the median age at 38 nationally and down to 35 in, uh, in North Dakota. Now that's going to have some substantial uh, impact on how our population grows in the future. Future growth is going to be driven by natural births, much more, much less so than the in-migration that, that really sparked the big boom that we had in the last few years. Again, kind of the tale of two states. Once again, the median age is uh, not consistent. We've got much long, younger uh, in the West, where we've got average ages in the low 30s. In our, in our urban counties, we're much younger. And then we go back into the central parts of the state where we're driven, where agriculture is the key driver, where we've got sparsely populated areas, the population is much older. So again, tale of two states. Now, I'm going to skip over some stuff because we're going to stay on time here. I don't want to be the one to bust the, uh, bust the schedule wide open. Uh, here's a little slide that, again, kind of illustrates that, how we've gotten much younger. If you look over on the right, what we've got in terms of population growth in children, it's moving quite a baby boom. In fact, there was just an article in the Fargo Forum the uh, day before yesterday that talked about how Alvin Dickinson, historically, the number of births uh, was about 300 per year. Last couple of years, they've been on track for over 700. So we're going to have some real issues in terms of being able to build the schools and infrastructure to try and accommodate that population growth. Again, here's just another little slide that talks about uh, future change in population. You can see on the right, our population growth, I think, is going to be slow and steady. In those growing counties, it's going to be driven by the fact that we've got a much younger population. Here's another really big takeaway. Now, North Dakota still is not very diverse, okay? We still only have a population of color of about 16%, uh, and that's up from 11% in 2010. But I think you really have to take a look at the percentage change to put it into perspective. North Dakota has seen a 64% increase in the population of color compared to 16% for the United States. So again, that's a really, really big change, even though we're still you know, not very diverse. So overall with the demographics, and I, I, I strike on this because the change has been so dramatic when you look at the historic conditions in North Dakota, um, you know, that dramatic population growth was fueled by a booming economy, and that was largely fueled by the oil and gas industry, and I'm going to talk about that specifically in a little bit. Uh, again, uh, future growth is going to, going to be um, uh, the result of births. And the characteristics have changed. We're younger and more diverse. I'm just going to touch briefly on our gross state product. And again, I throw this up there just to try and illustrate how the oil and gas industry and high oil, uh, high commodity prices in the uh, earlier, in the last five years, uh, really, really drew, uh, fueled a really booming economy. When you see a 75% increase in your GDP since 2000, it kind of makes you sit up and take notice. Now again, we also know that isn't sustainable. Uh, we took a pretty good crash uh, when the oil and gas market went, uh, went downhill in 2014. Unfortunately, that coincided when the egg commodity markets uh, went down as well. So the, oil, the North Dakota economy is still driven by commodities, oil and gas and agriculture. However, things have stabilized, especially in the oil and gas industry. I'm going to skip to the oil and gas. Now, I'm going to stop here on one thing in terms of we've talked a lot about workforce. Even though we've got this booming economy, we also have a serious workforce issue. We have 15,000 job openings in the state. The Governor Bergen likes to say that's the city of Jamestown. Now, the real key part of this is that uh, the state uh, North Dakota Job Services tracks the number <coughs> of uh, active resumes to uh, job openings. And statewide, we've got 0.29 active resumes for every job opening. So like everybody else, we've got a workforce issue. All right, now we'll go to the 800-pound uh, gorilla in the room, the oil and gas industry in North Dakota. Again, I'm going to throw these graphs up just for effect. Um, things are clipping right along, and then we get the hockey stick. Uh, in October, we set a record of uh, 15,000 wells and a million and a half barrels per day. Uh, the production is concentrated in those four core areas. 
And one of the key things to take away on our oil and gas industry is things have really stabilized. You know, prices went down, but the industry has gotten so much more efficient. They've gotten uh, efficiencies in technology in terms of drilling, <coughs> if, uh, technologies in terms of infrastructure. We have roads and pipelines. Uh, we've got the drilling rigs are much more efficient. You know, when things were at the height of the boom in 2014, there were over 200 rigs out there. Now there's 56. And the drilling time is, has decreased by about half. I have one other talking point down here. Oh, the other really big issue here is that the, uh, the uh, uh, recovery rates have improved dramatically. Uh, early on, maybe they were getting 3 to 5% of the recoverable oil. Uh, by about 2014, we were maybe getting 7 to 8. Currently, we're getting 13 to 15%. So all of these things are, are really um, making the uh, oil and gas industry much more stable, and I would, would argue much more susceptible to severe price shocks. Here's an example of the, some of the efficiencies. We've got clear improvements in infrastructure. Now, this is a slide that I stole from Justin Cringstead at the North Dakota Pipeline Authority, and the two lines to look at are the blue and the purple. So if you look back in October 10 at the left-hand side, pretty much everything that we were producing was going out by pipeline. Okay, well, as production ratcheted up, that, that capacity was quickly uh, overtaken, and then we started pump, pulling out oil uh, using rail, and the rail is the purple. So you can see at the height in 13 and 14, most of it was going out by rail, very little by pipeline. As you can see to the right-hand side in October 19, that's been, uh, that, that has been inversed, and we're now uh, have made dramatic progress in filling in uh, pipeline infrastructure. Again, I throw this chart in just for dramatic effect in terms of the amount of oil and gas that, that we're producing. That 15 billion or 1.5 billion gallons a day is significant. Now, <clears throat> some people seem to think that we've got more capacity. Uh, these aren't my predictions, but the North Dakota, they have the North Dakota Mineral Resources uh, predicts that North Dakota will hit 2 million barrels in the next 10 years. I think that's maybe a little optimistic, but you know, we didn't think we'd get to a million and a half either. Uh, oil and spot prices, again, this just shows that, you know, we've, we've got, it's a commodity. Prices are gonna go up and down. Now, one thing about this is that uh, the prices have seemed to have stabilized. We've gone up a little bit more, but with all of the efficiencies, I think the oil and gas industry is much less susceptible to huge price shocks. Now, again, these aren't my, my uh, estimates, but uh, Lynn Helms, the North Dakota uh, Head of Mineral Resources, is, is suggesting that the break-even points in our core counties can be as low as $12, $12 per barrel. So, um, again, I'm not going to take credit for the numbers, so, uh, but those, that's what, what's being put out there. <coughs> a couple of other interesting things, you know, these price shocks have, have given us some real fiscal fits in North Dakota, you know, which reminds us that we're still an economy that is dominated by commodities. Oil and gas is a commodity just like corn and wheat. Prices go up and prices go down. Um, I see I forgot to fill in the blank there. An example of our fiscal problems, NDSU has seen a 23% cut in its budget over the last two biennial. Uh, now on the flip side of it, we've got a little thing called the Legacy Fund in North Dakota that's funded by a portion of the uh, uh, extraction taxes. It's got a balance of $6.5 billion. And so there's a pretty interesting conversation going on about how do we spend it. Um, here's another issue. I know that this comes up frequently, the flaring issue out in the uh, uh, oil patch. Uh, we're doing much better than we were previously. Uh, for example, in 2011, we were flaring 36% of the natural gas. And as you can see by just the slide, we're doing much better. Okay, well, now we're only flaring about 17% of it. But that flaring is still a result of the fact that we don't have all the infrastructure in place that we need. Now, um, the current goal is to capture about 88%, and ultimately the goal that's been set by 2020 is to capture 91%. I don't think we're going to make the 2020 goal, but the industry continues to work on that. And, uh, and so again, that's a function of, of uh, infrastructure. So again, I think the key <laughs> takeaway, the industry stabilized, uh, the technolo technology changes and the infrastructure improvements are just phenomenal. Now, there's still a long way until this is played out. You know, some people say that, uh, you know, we're going to end up with 45, 50, maybe even 60,000 wells over a period of 
20, 30, or 40 years. And again, I like to stay out of the prediction business because the only thing for sure is that I'll be wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> activity is in the four counties and the breaking points have improved dramatically. Now I'm getting short on time, but I, I do have to stop and touch on agriculture just briefly. Um, troubles with agriculture started in 218, and I've got, you have to speak about agriculture in North Dakota because it's every bit, bit as, as important to the state as the oil and gas industry. So the trouble started in 218 with poor prices and, uh, and then the start of the uh, trade wars. But through 218, producers managed to positive cash flow. Um, the word that I got from my, my contacts is they said that the down dollars helped keep everybody straight. Now that's not my term, and I'm not passing any judgment on it. But those direct payments managed to keep cash flows positive in 2018. But in 2019, the troubles have, have mounted tremendously. We've got poor prices. Uh, the tariffs have hurt terribly. Uh, the tariffs are disproportionately impacting North Dakota. Uh, and the weather was horrible. Um, just a couple of little tidbits about how horrible the weather was. 60% uh, of the corn in North Dakota is still in the field. And that's going to cause troubles in the spring because that crop's got to come off before you can put another one on. Not to mention that we had a snowstorm in October and got about two feet of snow between <coughs> Christmas and New Year's. Soybeans, disproportionately affected. 75% of the soybeans in North Dakota go to the Pacific Northwest. 95% of the soybeans in the Pacific Northwest go to China. So this really is a, is, a, is a big deal for North Dakota. Some of our other crops were hurt too. Meat, we had disease problems, so producers are getting discounts. Here's a, here's a terrible one, potatoes. A lot of them had to get left on the ground. There's a potential shortage for potatoes for french fries. Okay? Not good. All right, sugar beets. We had uh, lots of sugar beets left in the ground. And uh, now the unharvested sugar beets and potatoes cause less of a problem in the spring. Then go till those up and plant over it. So um, I guess this is just, I'm going to say one thing about this is that Dr. Frayne Olson, a quote, the soybean supply chain has shifted and we are living through another major transition in agriculture in North Dakota. Okay. So this is a big deal. Now, there's going to be producers that are going to go under. That's without a doubt. Now, Frayne has also indicated that there may be some opportunity for generational transfer. Um, the conditions are perhaps putting some downward pressure, maybe not on sale prices, but at least leases. Um, but what's going to transpire in agriculture in North Dakota in the, in the next few years? If I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be standing right here. But this is a big, big thing for the state. So I guess the, the, the key points is, you know, we've really seen some substantial changes in North Dakota. Uh, our population has increased dramatically. Uh, we've got uh, a much younger population. Take away with oil and gas, it's stabilized. You know, it's, the infrastructure's caught up. Now we're gonna need to continue to invest in infrastructure, both for the industry and in third terms of schools. That's gonna be a big one. Williston right now is struggling to get a bond passed. Um, to build a new school. They need a super majority of 60%. Last vote, they got 58. So um, again, the price collapse in, in agriculture, same time as oil and gas, also caused us some significant fiscal issues. Um, and we've got substantial strain in the ag industry. So I guess the big takeaway that I would uh, take on this slide is go to the last two or three points. Um, the oil and gas industry is stabilized. It's gonna be, continue to be a major driver in our economy in North Dakota. Um, we've got serious concerns in agriculture, and I think both of these things point out that economic diversification, especially in North Dakota, is as important as ever. And unfortunately, I think we're relearning some of the lessons that we learned in the, in the 1970s and the 1980s. So with that, I will step aside, and I think I only went over a little bit. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Leo Moremzia, who is from the uh, Michigan Department of Labor Information. Well, I have. It's coming. <laughs> I have uh, just seven things that I want you to take away 
that um, we need to know about the Michigan Upper Peninsula's labor market. And the first one is that um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is an important part of Michigan, both culturally and economically. Uh, for those of you who are interested in, in history, you know that um, Michigan acquired the Upper Peninsula in 1837, when it was admitted in the Union. And that was to settle the, the war between Michigan and Ohio over the uh, Toledo Strip. Um, it represents about 29% of Michigan's land. Um, nine, uh, that's about 16,000 square miles, uh, and 9,000 of them are rich in natural resources. Uh, we're talking about timber, we're talking about uh, copper, iron, uh, nickel, and we, we, we are still exploring. So there are many other minerals to be discovered. Um, despite the size, only 3% of the population, um, uh, only uh, the, the population of UP represents only 3% of Michigan population. That's about 300,000 in 2018. So that brings me to the next fact about the labor market of the UP, is that its population has been declining and is forecast to continue to decline at least in the next 45 years. Um, so dramatic, you know, my colleagues have been using this curve to dramatically show what's happening. Um, the population of the UP peaked in 1975 and has been declining since, since then. Um, it's um, forecast to continue to decline. By 2045, we think that it's going to be around 280,000. Uh, so that's about 20,000 below the level that we have today. Out migration, domestic out migration, is the number one uh, uh, reason for this. Uh, we know, uh, for those of you uh, who work with population data, um, uh, uh, natural growth has been declining in many parts of, uh, not just in Michigan, but in many parts of the, the, the nation, uh, because just declining uh, fertility rates, uh, so declining birth rates, and in, in UP especially, increasing death rates as the population uh, uh, becoming much older, uh, and which I'm gonna show in a minute. So 60%, uh, uh, this is very interesting, 60% of the UP population reside in only four counties out of 15 that comprise the area. And those are Marquette, Chippewa, Houghton, and Delta. And all of all four of them have one common <coughs> trait is that they have a university or a college in it. There are only two counties, Houghton and Marquette, uh, whose uh, median age of the population is below the state's average. And that's, again, Houghton and Marquette. That's where you find in Houghton, that's where you have Northern, I mean, Michigan Tech. And in Marquette, that's where you have Northern Michigan University. So that, that you know, uh, uh, brings a constant flow of young person uh, in those two areas. I actually had a pyramid that was dramatically, that will show this dramatically, but because of time, I, I was advised to delete it. <laughs> um, so this brings me to the third fact about the labor market of UP, is that this population decline is also one factor that explains the lower uh, levels of labor force and employment in the area. So labor force has now returned, for example, into the pre-recessional levels um, in the UP. And that's in con contrast with the state. The state, after the recession, sees a steady uh, uh, increase in, in, in the labor force, 
UP has continually declined. We see an increase of labor force in the UP between 2003 and 2006, and this is because uh, the state closed uh, several prisons in the Lower Peninsula, and workers were allowed to relocate, and most of them end up in the UP. But since then, the, fact that the labor force has been declining, they accelerated during the recession, and hasn't recovered at all. So uh, compared to 2000, for example, we are still 12.4% uh, below the level of 2000. Unemployment rates, um, the pattern is almost the same as the states. Uh, uh, the UP in normal times tend to have a little bit higher unemployment rates, but within re uh, um, um, the margin of errors. Um, during the recession, UP actually had lower unemployment rates just because it depends less on the automotive industry uh, that we know Michigan depends on a lot. Um, employment, same trend. Um, um, by, two, uh, by 2018, the annual average uh, is about 18,500 below 2,000. We have not returned to the previous session of labels in the UP. Um, um, we stabilized, that's the good news. The employment has stabilized at, uh, since 2011 at about 130,000, and that's about 14,000 before below 2007 levels. So a natural question then uh, to up uh, actually is, uh, with this down, down, uh, down trade of in, in, the, in, in employment, uh, are there any industries that are growing? Uh, and which industries are declining? And so the next fact is that more than half, so we're talking about about 10 out of 19 industry sectors in the UP uh, are still losing jobs. And nearly 80% of UP's jobs are concentrated <coughs> in these six industry groups. Public, uh, public administration, so we're talking about local, federal, state, plus every tribe-owned business is counted in public, uh, public, public administration, sorry. Um, uh, is the largest employer in the UP, about 26%. Um, the uh, one thing that uh, is interesting is that um, in the UP, the sector of healthcare and social assistance, which in the state and in many other places around the nation has been growing even during the Great Recession. In the UP, that sector is declining. And mostly because of social, somebody mentioned about the social assistance that has been uh, declining, especially in rural areas with the closure of uh, 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 residential um, nursing, uh, nursing residential, uh, residential nursing, um, that is happening a lot in, 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 in the UP. And that brings us to the fifth fact about the UP uh, labor force, is about mining, which is our focus industry. And mining is a very important, uh, important part of the UP's economy, um, as we're gonna see in a minute. Um, so, if we're talking about jobs, mining is really small. It represents only 1.3% of payroll jobs in the UP. But if you look at the state, that's about a quarter of mining jobs in the whole state. Now, if you look at, um, and I think I'm going to point to this, if you look at uh, mining jobs, they have been declining over the past two decades, right? Uh, and the decline is usually 
it coincides with the closure of mines. So mines have uh, a limited life of production. And when they get to the, to the end of the production, the, the, that, that life, they have, to, they have to show that they still have enough to, 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 to keep producing. Otherwise, they close. And when they close, of course, the, the pull factors go away and employment goes away. So if you look at uh, between 2000 and 2018, uh, mining uh, jobs in UP dropped by 35% from 2,200 to about 1,500. The all other private industries combined, they still drop by, by just 13%. That's how dramatic it is. You see some up swing here between 2011 and 2014. That's because uh, the state approved the start of mining of nickel in the UP. And that actually has a lot of effect as we're going to see in the next few slides. Um, I, I, I wanted to look at you know, the demographics of mining uh, workers. Um, and they are older. They are predominantly male. And they are in a prime working age than the, uh, compared to other private, say, uh, private industries. Um, so for example, other private industries combined <coughs> Uh, the jobs are uh, equally distributed among uh, across genders, with a little bit of majority of male, 51 percent. In mining, 93 percent are male. Right. Um, the educational attainment is the same. 45 percent um, uh, have a high school diploma or less. In other private industries, 43 percent. So it's the the same distribution. That's why I don't. I'm not even. But despite the low levels of employment and declining, uh, the wages in the mining industry in UP has been increasing dramatically. Between 2018, uh, 2000 and 2018, uh, all other private sectors combined, the wages increased by only $300. And we're talking about nominal uh, values. In, in, in mining increased by $1,000 over this period. The GDP, the contribution to the GDP is just breathtaking. And it has been rising over the past two decades. So the GDP, for example, rose to about $1.13 billion in 2011. Um, and it's now, so that's, um, uh, today the mining is the fourth contributor to the UP GDP um, uh, after uh, real estate and, and manufacturing. So this is another really interesting chart. Uh, if you look at the distribution of mining uh, GDP across the state, uh, a third of it, over a third of it, is produced in only one county of the UP, and that's Marquette. That's a little over $700,000 in 2018. It's followed by uh, Wayne, oops, sorry. Okay. How do you know? yeah. Followed by Wayne in Southeast Michigan at 14%. Um, and another fact is that uh, about four counties of Michigan provide 62% of mining GDP, and two of them are in, in, in the UP, that's Marquette and Schoolcraft. And then you have two, which is the Wayne and Monroe in Southeast says Michigan. Actually, that's where they mine salt. I, I just learned that. Uh, because you know the data was showing me that, and I, I got curious. Apparently, they, we mine salt under the city of Detroit. <laughs> uh, we didn't know that. <laughs> the sixth um, uh, uh, fact is that almost all occupational groups in mining pay above not only regional average, but also state average. Uh, the regional average in 2008 uh, uh, was about 
$16.59. The, um, the average wage for the state was $18.02. And uh, only two groups uh, of occupations pay lower than this in the UP, in the mining UP. Um, construction and extraction is the largest uh, occupational group in the mining. Um, which it provides about a third of mining jobs. Um, and it's, it, it's also, it provides about 40% of annual openings, uh, mostly to replace workers that are leaving the, uh, the, the, um, um, the, uh, the industry, the area. Um, uh, the largest uh, detailed occupations are uh, about um, blast about uh, uh, first line construction, uh, uh, supervisors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So certainly in mining, um, but also more generally, employment in UP is expected to be flat at, at, at best. Uh, these are projections to 2026, and in the UP. Jobs are actually projected to decline by 1.5%, that's about minus 1,800 by 2026. The only group that is projected to grow is jobs that require more than a bachelor's degree or higher. And even then, the growth is about eight times lower than what is showing statewide. So, um, in a few sentences. Um, so despite a decline in population and labor force, the UP's wealth in natural resources such as copper, iron, nickel, and others to be discovered represent a large contribution to the area and state GDP. And the contribution has been rising over the past two decades while employment has been declining which suggests some uh, sort of increasing productivity in the mining industry in the UP. With that, um, I will take your questions. Thank you. presentations. We, we have a, a shortened time frame for questions, uh, and so I'd like to turn it over to the audience pretty quickly. But I do have kind of one, one common theme that struck me from your two presentations, um, is that, um, and, and particularly, Leo, in your slides, um, I, I think it's interesting that even though we've seen an increase uh, in, in new mining operations in the UP in the last few years, um, we've seen uh, a d decline in mining employment in spite of that. And, uh, and Nancy, this is true also in the back end, uh, where even though the industry is, the oil output has stabilized and actually increased in the last few years, mining, or, uh, employment in the industry is off of its peak. And that presents challenges for how you think about the future of development, in particular when you think about population projections. And I just kind of wonder how you think about the role of continued technological development in these fields and the long-term growth prospects. Well, I'll go ahead and take a stab at it. Yeah, the you know we did lose a lot of jobs in the oil patch when the prices cracked and uh, crashed in 2014, about 15,000. Um, and we would have thought that we would have seen some really terrible negative repercussions from losing 15,000 jobs that quickly. But what had happened is that the people that held those jobs just packed up their RVs and moved out of their crew camps and went back home. So well, we did have a little bit of contraction, um, you know. It, we didn't have negative repercussions. And I think what what's, we've seen is a stabilization. We'll continue to see some efficiencies, but I don't think you're going to see those kinds of big contractions in terms of, of labor force. Because we've got pipelines, and we aren't trucking everything anymore. So I, I think what we saw in the past in terms of losing that many jobs in that short period of time was just a function of, of the one-time anomaly where we, you had something that just went boom. And then the, the prices forced everything to, to come back into place. Um, and I think that we'll see continued job increases out there, despite tech, uh, efficiencies, maybe in the drilling side of it. Because long term, for every, um, I think you need a couple people for every well drilled. So as we add wells, we'll need to add that, that workforce that will, that will do the uh, maintenance long term. So. <coughs> 
Well, in, uh, in the UP, I think uh, the mining industry is really adapting to the declining population. Uh, so they are uh, uh, putting more technology, not only because of the declining population, yes, that's one factor, but also because they are being required to do more than just the traditional mining. They have to really use technology to show that they're now going to, that they're gonna have minimal impact to the environment. <coughs> And so when you look, and I, you know, this is uh, the fellow from uh, uh, Montana, is it? Yes, I was advertising about going to Montana. They said, if you want to really see the state of art, the art of mining, you need to come and visit the Nikko mining. Uh, <laughs> it's really state of the art. Um, uh, and, and so they, they have to show to the state that they're not going to impact uh, they, and so they are bringing in a lot of technology, hiring very few people, but really knowledgeable people, and that, that being paid a lot, and producing more, so increasing productivity. Another question over here. Hi, Nancy. Yes. You said that in your state, your population's getting more diverse. What's the driving force behind that? Is it low cost of living? Is it something else? I, I would just say I haven't taken a deep dive into it, but I think we're just basically seeing, we're seeing in migration because we largely still have a pretty healthy economy. So we've got people that are coming in from other places that are more diverse um, that, that, uh, that are coming in and taking jobs. Uh, we're also seeing increase in population in our, in our Native American uh, populations. So I think it's just simply a function of the, you know, despite the fact we've got kind of the tale of two states, uh, we still have, we've got a pretty healthy economy in North Dakota right now. Again, we've got some fiscal issues, uh, but you know, we've got more jobs and we've got people to fill them. So I think that's what's driving it right there. Question over here. Hi Nancy, as your neighbor to the south, we felt some secondary effects of your guys' boom. <laughs> so um, I guess the question I would have, if, if there's any major price shock you know, in oil, would you expect that you would have a, a boom again, or do you think with the infrastructure in place, you know, that's not very really likely? Well, I, I think if we see prices go up, yeah, you'll see exploration expand past beyond that that core producing area because if it's productive, you're <coughs> going to pull it out, and it's just about a sure thing when you put a hole in the ground that you're going to get something out. In terms of seeing that kind of boom again, I don't think we're going to see that again. Uh, when when this all transpired, you have to remember that that was in a part of the state that had been declining for decades. I mean, there were, there were no roads, there were no schools, there were no houses, there was no anything. So then when you have this huge influx, yeah, it just explodes. And I think there's so much of that that's in place now. We've got bypasses in, in uh, Williston and Watford City, and we've got uh, you know, refining capacity, we've got homes that have been built. Um, so I don't, no, I don't think we're gonna see a repeat of that. That's a, that's a one-time deal that, that you know, was kind of a perfect storm, in my opinion. So when Leo was up there, it made me think, you know, we haven't heard anything today about hemp and cannabis. So wondering, you know, how do you think that, that will affect the Michigan, even in the UP, and also just hemp production in general in this region? Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if I am qualified to discuss that. I was <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it has been approved. Uh, there was a proposal that, that, that the, the people of Michigan approved to, 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 to make uh, uh, marijuana uh, uh, recreational. And uh, there's, there's still a lot of discussion going on about how they're gonna regulate it. Uh, so it hasn't really, uh, actually, um, you know, I, I teach a class in public policy and program evaluation at Michigan State. And one of the projects that I, I want to give to the students is to evaluate the impact of that uh, on different things of, of Michigan. So maybe, you know, ask me the same question in June, I will, I will, I will have some answer off the records. <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought you might be prepared to ask about industrial hemp as, as an agricultural product, which I know is of interest in North Dakota. I don't know, Nancy, if you have any thoughts on that. I don't think I had. I, I just, I'm just not familiar where it's at. I, yeah, that's, yeah. I didn't do my homework on that question. So. Okay. Do you have any other questions for both? There's one uh, back here. 
and Mark Finstead. I, I live in northwestern Minnesota and a uh, question for Leo. Uh, we visit uh, the UP quite often, snowmobiling, motorcycling, it's a great recreation area. I'm wondering if the state could focus a little bit more on recreational development to help employment in that area because it's a wonderful place to visit. Yes, and, and um, you know, maybe when we go to, uh, is it Missoula in Montana next year to talk about this, <laughs> right? <laughs> we may focus on, on tourism because tourism is, is, is a huge industry in, in, in the UP uh, it, um, and, and in, in all seasons. Um, so they are able to switch from uh, a summer recreation activity to winter. Um, uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, when you look at the uh, tourism industry, is greatly affected of, uh, to what, uh, it depends on what is happening in the lower peninsula. Because when the jobs are down in the lower peninsula and people are not going up, you know, people from Minnesota and Wisconsin go there, but yeah, many Michiganders from the lower peninsula go there. Uh, I go there every, maybe two, four or five times a year. Um, and so when the jobs are bad in the lower peninsula, it affects the tourism. But that's something that we can talk about in the next other conferences. I think next time I'm going to oh. put in a shameless plug for tourism in North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get left out. <laughs> I think we have time for uh, one more question. Alan Tomas from the University of Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Marimba, uh, two questions if I might. Um, I see some parallels between northern Minnesota mining and in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula. Um, you know, there's been a decline in uh, employment uh, and it's tougher economic times. Uh, is the state of Michigan uh, developed any specific programs to help or encourage uh, mining in the Upper Peninsula? Um, again, it's, it's, you know, as a state employer, uh, I, I, I'm not really required to talk about policies, um, um, but mining is, is, is an interesting industry because it affects the environment. Mm -hmm. And there are many groups that are not, that really don't like it. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the approval of nickel mining, which we know is very important in the automotive electric batteries, right? Uh, so it's something that the, the three, the big three really wanted to, to see happening. But it took a long time to approve because it really has a big impact on the environment. And these new groups are really making sure that if, if it's approved, it has minimal impact on, 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 on in the, the environment. So it's not just the, the state policy, it's all these, these groups that, that, yeah, that. And I think it's a good thing that, yes, it, it's employing fewer people, but we see that it's paying more. Um, and it's really, uh, uh, making sure that the, the mines are really state of the art and are having uh, a lower impact, a really minimal impact on the environment. Great, right. thank you. Thank you both uh, for, for your presentations and uh, we're gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ron Wirtz, to start our second panel, but if we could just thank them really quick. Thank you for that uh, great panel. Uh, we have our last session. Uh, my name is Ron Wirtz. I'm a regional outreach director for the bank. Uh, and our last session is going to be a little bit closer to home with two panelists to talk about the Minnesota economy and the, and the Wisconsin economy, uh, and with a little bit of focus on manufacturing. Real quickly, we're going to hand, be handing out some uh, evaluation forms. We'd love it if you could give us some feedback before you leave. You can either leave it in your chair or leave it in a box as you go out. So our first session, uh, will feature uh, Steve Hine. He is a senior researcher. He is a senior researcher with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. He's also the former director of the Labor Market Information Office. And for those of you that are here from Minnesota, you recognize Steve's name very often in the newspaper. He's kind of the face of Minnesota for all things employment. So please welcome Steve Hine. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everybody. This is a very fascinating uh, event. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have been invited. Uh, I've learned a great deal. Um, I've also, uh, <laughs> um, 
Um, okay, so. Um, green button. Green button. Bingo. All right. Um, so I want to first look at some of the indicators. It would suggest to me if uh, I didn't know as much as I do, <laughs> that, that our state economy seems to be entering uh, a, a, at least a soft spot, if not uh, by some indicators, uh, a, a recessionary situation. Uh, and then I want to point out that while we know a lot more about the underlying factors and what those might be doing to some of these indicators, but for example, in the upper left there, there's, there's the state unemployment rate. Um, over the last year and a half, we've seen about a half a percentage point increase in our state unemployment rate. Uh, we had a little bit of a tick up back in, in 2016. Uh, as, as I sit and listen to the other presenters, I, I remember that at the time, that was attributed to the fact that the Bakken uh, fields uh, were suffering and a lot of those workers that went over to the Brockham Field, came from Minnesota, and then they apparently packed up their RVs and came right on back. So, you know, uh, that, that was a temporary uh, situation. But, you know, we're, we're seeing an increase here in Minnesota in our unemployment. Uh, the number of unemployed individuals has gone up by about 20% uh, over that uh, time period in which we've seen an increase. Upper right uh, of the chart here shows our annual job growth rate relative to the nation. And uh, since mid-2017, we've been la lagging the, the nation quite significantly. Uh, in fact, uh, back in, in February, if you look at that blue line very closely, we, we actually had a slight over the year decline in total non-farm employment in our state. <coughs> Never have we had an over the year decline in jobs when we weren't in a recession. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, those of you that were around or even in other parts of the 9th District, remember that February was just a really bad month weather-wise. Uh, you know, so, so that turned out to be uh, temporary. Um, but nonetheless, even since then, uh, we've been in the low tenth uh, of a percent uh, range in terms of our annual job growth. Uh, lower left shows the employment that we see, again, in an over-the-year uh, change basis in employment services, uh, which is about 92% of that in Minnesota anyways is, is temp health jobs. Um, thought to be by many a, a very good leading indicator of what the economy might be doing. And you can see that, you know, lately we've seen declines in that measure that look a lot like the declines that we saw in 2001 and 2008, and, and uh, even worse than the almost non existent recession here in 1991. Uh, and then lastly, um, somebody else mentioned the, the fact, Leo, you mentioned this in, with respect to the Upper Peninsula, the number of our major uh, industry sectors that are showing uh, over the year declines uh, has been as high as seven recently. Uh, frequently, five out of the 11 have shown declines in employment over the year. And, and this has persistently included areas like healthcare. All right, a, a, a sector that never even showed an annual decline during the Great Recession. Um, but we, we have certainly seen an increase in the number of sectors that, were, uh, that are seeing declines. Uh, but you know, so you look at this and go, well, okay, we're in, in or entering a recession. But there are mitigating or, or extenuating uh, factors that a lot of people have mentioned throughout the morning here. And I, I'm fortunate, I guess, just to be able to uh, sort of review some of those. Uh, one of them is the, the significant demographic shifts that we've all been seeing. Um, and, and I want to uh, uh, particularly focus on, on what that means for our labor force growth and where our labor force growth has been coming from and will continue to come from in the years ahead. And, and then secondly, uh, a topic that I've been very interested in uh, that does speak to, I think, a lot of the challenges that our states have had and will have in the years ahead, and that's the impact of technological change 
is, is likely to have, especially around uh, the world of work. Um, so first, I, I want to look at uh, a chart here, and again, similar charts to what others have shown here. Um, but this is Minnesota's labor force growth. On the, on the left, the blue bars, those are the annual change in labor force participants from one year to the next since states started tracking this in, in 1976. Uh, for, for 25 years, Minnesota averaged uh, just under 40,000 additional labor force participants per year. Uh, some of those years, one year, back in the late 70s, <coughs> top 70,000, about 74 or something thousand. You know, a, a, a number of years we topped 50,000 additional participants in a year. Uh, that all pretty much came to a screeching halt in 2001. Um, one factor that, that drove that is the fact that the earliest baby boomers, um, that big bulge in our population that has been underlying uh, all of these demographic shifts, those, ba those early baby boomers started to hit 55. Uh, uh, we also kind of hit a point about then in, in Minnesota and, and most states in the nation where steadily rising female participation rates no longer had any further room to improve. So um, that, that leveled off and, and sort of cut off that as a source of those strong annual growth rates. If we look what we expect to happen in the years ahead, uh, and again now, the, the peak baby boomers, those born in, in 55, 56, around that area, are now gonna turn 65 in the next year or two. And that has dire consequences for what we expect to happen in terms of our labor force growth in, in the years ahead. Um, the, these are projections that come from our state demographer's office. They're the official projections. I will go ahead and use them. They do point out the blue bars in, in, in five-year increments here show that they project that our labor force will grow at about 5,300 <coughs> additional labor force participants per year uh, for the next 10 years, okay? Uh, that's that's about 55,000 additional participants over the next 10 years, all right? That was a good year back in the 70s, 80s, and even as recently as 1999. So we're gonna see a significant decrease in the rate at which we're adding labor force participants. And what growth we are gonna have in the purple bars is largely on uh, the part of the, uh, the labor force that is 65 and older. Partly because that's an increasing share of our population, but also partly because when these projections were done, it was done at a time when we started to see increasing labor force participation among the older cohort. Um, I, I've always been a bit nervous about this um, as I uh, uh, close in on retirement and think, do I want to work until I'm 70 or <laughs> no? <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of that was born out of necessity. Uh, in, in 12, 13, 14. Um, and so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic that those projections on older cohort participation rates are gonna come to pass. Now, it, what does that mean in terms of our labor force growth as it has happened over the last uh, few years or decade or more? Um, here's some American Community Survey data uh, between 2007 and 2018. Um, and, and this table breaks it out by labor force participants and their labor force status or employment status here uh, based on whether they're native born, by that I mean US born, not Minnesota born, uh, versus foreign born, born outside the United States. And uh, what you can see is that over the past 10 or 11 years, um, over two thirds of our labor force growth has come through increases in our foreign born labor force. All right, a, a labor force growth rate that is 27 times that of our native born population, all right? So if it were not for the increase that we have seen in our foreign born workforce, that 15,000 a year that we have been averaging over the last 15 years would have been more like 5,000, all right? 
the 5,000 that we would see if these projections are right over the next 10 years is going to be a lot less, you know, or would have, would have been a lot less, uh, were it not for the fact that we anticipate and hope that we will continue to see uh, rapid growth in our labor force, uh, our foreign-born uh, labor force participants. Um, but, you know, the times that we are in, uh, uh, I note that in 2018, very recent data um, from the American Community Survey uh, shows that our labor force, um, foreign-born labor force, only grew by 3,000 over the last year, um, after averaging about 12,000 over the 10 years prior to that. So we do, uh, I hope, only see a, a, a blip, but nonetheless a concerning blip in terms of um, recent trends in this source of our labor force. If we were to break this out now, and this, uh, there's a, highly, a high correlation, especially in Minnesota where a significant share of our population of color is is also foreign born, but nonetheless, um, breaking it out by, between white, non-Hispanic, and all other populations of, of color, the, the source of labor force growth by this breakout is even more dramatic, all right? Over the past 10 years, all of our employment growth has been through increases in uh, minority employment, and 130% of our labor force growth. Okay, so all of it and then some has come about through increases in our uh, workforce of color. You, you see that, you know, white non-Hispanic labor force participants have declined by over 50,000 over the last 10 years, 11 years, I guess. Okay, so, uh, you know, we, we certainly, uh, well, the baby boom bulge in our population is largely native-born, white, non-Hispanic Minnesotans. And, and uh, uh, I'm sure that is the case with, with other states. Data that others have presented, uh, I, uh, I, I suspect, are very much in line with this. Um, uh, something else that has been noted uh, by others, too, is the role that domestic met migration has played. Um, after a decade or so of seeing more people leave the state than enter the state, um, 2017, we actually saw a very promising sign in that more people came here from other states than left. And, uh, you know, that was, oh boy, we had a party. But, you know, that, was, that was really good news. Uh, um, you know, the question then is, well, will it, will it last? Uh, the new data just uh, recently came out from the Census Bureau's uh, population estimate program, and, and we there's actually a yellow bar there right at the end. It's only 65 people high, so it, it barely shows up. So uh, you know, it doesn't um, necessarily uh, lead to optimism that we're going to see continued growth in, from that source. So, uh, you know, I, I think we've got a, a couple of concerns here in, in Minnesota, some of which must easily translate to many other states in the, in the Ninth District and, and nationally, and, and that is what is the impact of policy and, and, and hints that we're seeing uh, a slowing in international migration as a source of workers, and, and here in Minnesota anyways, uh, a, a, what looked like a promising turnaround in domestic net migration suddenly starting to disappear. I attribute it to marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> the other point I want to talk about uh, is, is the impact of technology. There's been a lot of concentration focus, a lot of reports, a lot of alarmist predictions about the robots. Uh, taking over and, and taking all our jobs. Uh, there's been a lot of efforts to try to measure this, um, and, and they vary uh, quite significantly in, in, in their, their suggestions. Um, but for better, for better or worse, I'm gonna add to that mix, but I, I do think with promising results, I'd love to talk about this in more detail uh, at, at any point. Um, but, uh, I. I've built on some of the standing existing research here to develop a, a metric by occupation of how susceptible different occupations are based on the tasks that comprise them. 
um, and, and use that then to sort of look at how different sectors, aggregations within our economy uh, might weather the kinds of technological progress that we are seeing and can anticipate in the form of artificial intelligence, uh, large data, you know, um, uh, cloud computing, uh, machine learning, and so on. Here's an aggregation of these scores that look at what industry sectors are most likely to be impacted. Um, and, uh, you know, down, uh, well, let's start, let's be optimistic, we start at the top. A lot, of, a lot of teaching is a very sort of abstract, interpersonal kind of activity, as, as the um, literature would call it, professional scientific technical services. You know, the kinds of jobs that, that I think um, are deemed to be well-paying. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, we, we unfortunately see manufacturing. There's actually, this is cut off, uh, there's one more below manufacturing, and that's the uh, leisure and hospitality sector, okay? So sectors at the top are sectors that this task decomposition exercise would suggest are made up of occupations that are more likely to be complemented by technological advance, while sectors at the bottom are made up of occupations that are more likely to be substituted. All right. Um, it, it is the case that the kinds of technology that is going to be brought to bear here is going to impact all occupations in one way or another. But when we think about the impact that it might have on a, a employment levels, you know, I think it, it's uh, um, generally uh, the expectation that we'll see a shift in employment from the lower end to the upper end. Okay. Um, uh, that that is shown in this. Uh, scatter plot of those scores that I developed here and the log of, of annual income. Um, higher scores are less prone, let's say, less prone to substitution, more prone to complementary uh, consequences. Um, so we'll fly through that one. Here's, here's a ranking that looks at states. And so I want to bring this uh, to our attention maybe as a closing point. Because um, it does, uh, I think, um, point out some of the challenges that this district is going to have, maybe Minnesota notwithstanding. <laughs> uh, but uh, in terms of the, the kinds of occupations, industry mix, the fact that we're, we're, um, we have a high concentration in, in a number of our states in manufacturing, uh, which in turn are uh, the kinds of occupations that might be susceptible to the substitution by machines, uh, we see that um, Minnesota, um, it, if I rank these, we, we came in 13th, pre pretty decent. Um, I find it odd that District of Columbia is, is seen as a as an economy with highly cognitive <laughs> uh, workforce, uh, you know, but there's a lag in the data, so <laughs> um, But, you know, again, I mean, Michigan, Montana, Wisconsin, the Dakotas, um, you know, they're, they're ranking in the, in the high 30s or, or lower. A lot of that, and, and I, I break this out by, you know, the, the industry sectors and, and so on. And it, it you know, certainly the, re the reliance of some of these state economies on, on areas like manufacturing and agriculture uh, contribute to the um, prediction that these data would give us is that the type of impact that technology will have it is not necessarily going to mean that these will lose jobs. I mean, the dead last state on this list is Nevada. Well, they've got a lot of, you know, um, leisure and hospitality jobs in, in uh, Nevada, which is an industry that is made up of occupations that are fairly easily um, automated. I, I, I watched a video of a bed that makes itself. I, you know, <laughs> I, it was quite fascinating. I, you know, every day you, you read about new uh, uh, technology. Um, so I'm gonna wrap that up. Um, and let me just say that as with all the other presenters, 
we see the impact of these significant demographic changes, which I interpret largely as, as translating into we have a great reliance on our populations of color and our immigrant workforce in the years ahead. And, and we, as many others do, you know, see those segments of our workforce having particular struggles that we, we need to um, uh, deal with. Um, and uh, so I will leave that. Maybe these slides are available through the website? Is yes. that Okay, it's good, good. So I'll, I'll end it with that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Always entertaining, and even after, in retirement, I hope you keep yourself available for events like this. <laughs> so our last speaker uh, is Taggart Brooks. Taggart, uh, or TJ, is a professor and chair of the economics department at the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse. He also owns his own consulting firm, and he, like Steve, is also uh, based in the media in the La Crosse region for the western Wisconsin area. And before I bring TJ up, I think we all can acknowledge the toughest part of a, of a conference like this with as much content, content is to be the last speaker. So TJ, I think, as you'll find, is going to be the perfect wrap-up for this. But more than anything, I need a disproportionately loud welcome for TJ. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, we're at the point where if this was class and we're sort of towards the end of the lecture, I'd ask my students any questions, and then I'll stare at each other and say, can you raise your hand? Because <laughs> I think that if he, no one raises their hand, uh, he's going to let us go early. Um, I promised Ron that I would finish in under an hour, so we'll get to it as quick as possible. Um, if you've ever seen a research economist from the Fed talk, they always have these sort of elaborate disclaimers, and so I wanted to start with my own. Uh, on the off chance my wife is watching online, she gets very nervous when I talk, so I, uh, I hardly have any idea about what I'm about to say today, so of course my employer and the sponsors are not liable for what comes out of my mouth, either my wife or my, uh, or my mother. Um, uh, my job is to talk about manufacturing in Wisconsin. I took that very literally, so I will really focus on manufacturing in, uh, in Wisconsin uh, as well. I want to start with sort of a story. My, uh, my father is uh, born in 1947, and he's uh, the beginning of the baby boomers. And uh, I grew up in the, um, in the 80s and had to live through sort of my father always lamenting the fact that we don't make anything anymore in this country. And I never quite understood that. And uh, sort of years later, I'm putting together some graphs like that, I, I suddenly understood sort of what he, what he meant. What he meant was that we don't employ as many people in the manufacturing, any, the manufacturing sector anymore. I think this is a, a stark picture. Really, this is sort of the, the gross employment numbers in terms of uh, hundreds of thousands. And so you can see that you know, in the 80s, it peaked sort of at 18 million. But remember, the labor force is growing through this whole period. Uh, so the percentage of people in manufacturing has been declining since, uh, since the 50s. I really wish the internet was around back in the 80s because I would have known I could have shut my dad up quickly by saying, okay, boomer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, uh, I like showing this graph. So this is a picture of uh, using the current employment statistics on manufacturing. And uh, it gives you sort of a sense of the importance in these three states of manufacturing. But I really like showing it because for a while in Wisconsin, there's sort of a, down where I live, there's sort of the good side of the river, which I'm on in Wisconsin, and the bad side of the river. I'm very confused where I am now because I see the river, but I think if I'm over there, it's still the bad side. Sorry. Um, it's not smart to play to the home crowd like that, right? Um, anyhow, it's really interesting because we have similar populations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, but yet you see in terms of gross numbers of employees in the manufacturing sector, Wisconsin is far more reliant on manufacturing. But what I really like was sort of this battle between states when we had a, you had a Democratic governor, we had a Republican governor, and back and forth people would you know, always point to whoever their favorite politician was and say they're really responsible for economic growth in the area. And what I think you can see very starkly in these pictures, can you figure out what governor was in power at different points through this 30-year uh, period? I challenge you to. You can't. They look exactly the same, just at different levels. This is really sort of getting at the fact that this industry is a cyclical industry and really sort of follows national trends in terms of the business cycle. That is to say, uh, local or you know, state politicians have far less impact on sort of the ebb and flow of those um, employment flows than we might think. Um, but here's recent data, and so you, you saw on that previous slide that um, while the uh, uh, employment had declined, it had sort of been rising more recently, but it, if you look at very recently, the, uh, using the current employment statistics, the last few months, 
uh, looked to be very bad for Wisconsin in particular in terms of employment, suggesting sort of a softening or uh, an actual recession of manufacturing. You've seen writing about that. I'm here to suggest that might not be the case, um, uh, but let me also show you some other evidence of a softening in the, uh, the economy. So this would be the uh, Institute for Supply Chain Management, the Purchasing Managers Index that we often see. If it's below that red line, that suggests a recession. Um, if it's above, that suggests sort of a period of growth. And you can clearly see that you know uh, the recession in 2008 uh, depicted there, and you can see we've dipped below um, uh, 50 in the last few readings of this, suggesting again manufacturing entering uh, a recession. Um, maybe we know some reasons why. Uh, uh, we like to shoot ourselves in the foot in this country, apparently. So tariffs uh, hurt manufacturing. No kidding. Um, <laughs> this is the one thing that's really been frustrating as an economist. I thought we were successful in convincing people that free trade was good for everybody. Bill Clinton, a Democrat, sort of you know, passed free trade agreements, and we thought we'd finally convince people of something that economists generally believe in. And, uh, and then you know, this latest uh, uh, round of politics happened, and so now we're very uh, confused about what we were teaching in, uh, in class and why students don't seem to pay attention. Well, this is uh, fake news, of course. <coughs> really? That's not going to be All right. It's like a rubber chicken, right? It's kind of a stupid joke at this point. Um, but let me explain why it might, in fact, be fake news. So here's where um, I think that it's really uh, difficult to sort of follow data for a couple of reasons. One, we know that sort of the data that's produced is often produced with a lag and with varying degrees of sort of uncertainty around the data itself. So I'm going to present two pieces of data here. This is actually not due to me. Someone at uh, University of Madison kind of pointed this out. The, uh, the red line is the current employment statistics. That's a survey that BLS uh, puts out. Of, uh, of employers. And then the black line is sort of the quarterly census of employment workers. It's uh, really a census, so it's more comprehensive. Many more, you know, all employees, uh, employers that are involved in sort of uh, unemployment insurance and they have to report. So we're getting two different messages from the, these two things. The surveys are often sort of ex post or after the fact readjusted to sort of uh, match the, uh, the, the census that comes out. Um, after a, a year or so, but survey data recently has suggested a decline in manufacturing that we've seen and heard talked about in the press. But if you actually look at the, uh, the, the census uh, uh, data on that, um, that suggests a softening but not necessarily a decline. All right, So that might be fake news. We'll, we'll uh, wait to see what happens with that trend. So I want to talk about the, the, the state of Wisconsin. First one, sort of picture the uh, Federal Reserve District, 9th District. I'm very apologetic to my Uber colleague for not including. But one, I was worried about it crushing the graph a little bit more. Two, I would have had to code up all those counties, and so I was lazy, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, I made this graph and said, and again, I apologize. Um, I, uh, I really like making graphs. Uh, I couldn't find the right projection that I wanted for this. So for the rest of these slides that involve the state of Wisconsin, can you just do this with me? <laughs> um, instead, it would have taken a lot of coding time to figure out how to uh, change it. But so you see the, the ninth district, and the, uh, and the seventh district here. So I'm located in that sort of lower left-hand corner of the blue. I can see over the wall into the seventh district for where I am, but that's the, the last frontier. I'm gonna, sorry Nancy, uh, I'm gonna steal the, the tale of two states and I'll talk about sort of, both sort of the state of Wisconsin as a whole and then talk about the different, uh, differences between the division there, the districts. Um, so we'll start with sort of employment. I'll talk about employment, establishments. I'll move on to sort of uh, wages and then sort of talk about um, employment again as I wrap up. So the uh, uh, Wisconsin, sort of, this is the annual average employment. You can see that we started in 2007 with 500,000 uh, uh, um, uh, jobs in the, uh, uh, in the manufacturing sector. So all of this data is, by the way, on the uh, next code, the uh, 1013, sort of manufacturing. And you can see that uh, the recession was painful, um, and, and we've started to recover, but we have not fully recovered those jobs uh, since uh, the recession in 2007. Um, this gives you a breakdown by county. You can see that I, uh, it's a hand drawn in line there that separates sort of the 7th and 9th, 9th districts. And this would look at sort of the level of employment in 2007 versus the level of employment in 2018, uh, with the average uh, uh, percentage change over, the, uh, uh, over that time period. And you can see sort of the blue counties are ones that actually added jobs, and then the, the uh, uh, red ones are uh, uh, the ones who uh, lost jobs over that period. The darker the, the color, the sort of more of the loss. The gray one is, of course, uh, censored because it uh, has too few employers in the area. Um, 
uh, to discuss. So you can see there's some interesting pockets. Uh, it's always fun to try to like, and I don't have access to the data, I think some of the, my, my colleagues do in the, in the state uh, uh, offices, but um, I still try to figure that out. Apparently, like, so that, that lower uh, left-hand corner blue down in Wisconsin is Iowa County. That's where Land's End is located, if you're familiar with Land's End. There's also a Visions, Topic something or other. It's for uh, uh, rifle scopes. So they apparently are experiencing a boom, which I found disturbing. Uh, but it's a, you know, there's a lot of hunters in Wisconsin, and, and given the deer population, we need more of them, please. They eat my bushes, so I would never go hunting myself, but after they, you run into one with your car, and then they eat all your landscaping, then you want to murder all of them. Um, so I'm happy to see them, uh, uh, their business booming. Anyhow, so now if I break that up by the 7th and the 9th uh, district, again, sort of the, the, we're in the 9th and the 7th is, um, the bulk. You can see that Wisconsin really, it's a, the tail of two Wisconsin is one with a population and one without a population, sort of more rural. So most of the employment happens in southeastern Wisconsin, as you would expect. About 13% happens in, in the uh, sort of northwestern half of Wisconsin that's in the 9th district. But what's interesting is the 9th district is fully recovered in terms of its level of employment. And then the, 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 the lagging uh, that is occurring in the employment uh, sector is occurring because of the manufacturing that happens in sort of the southeastern part of the state. Um, I'll skip that one. All right, so we'll move on to establishment. So others have pointed out in different ways and shapes that uh, there has been um, a consolidation in particular industries. The uh, best talk was uh, fantastic and sort of hearing about what's going on with uh, farms in Wisconsin. And you see similar things happening in manufacturing. Either the manufacturer is going completely out of business or there is some consolidation going on, the number of establishments has declined, and declined a lot more than the, uh, than the employment has. Uh, here's what you have in sort of uh, uh, Wisconsin, US, and Minnesota. You can see that Wisconsin uh, has not sort of clawed back as much as Wisconsin, or excuse me, the US, and Minnesota has in terms of establishment counts. But here's the, the picture, so it's starker. So this again is the same idea, taking the 2007 uh, count of establishments looking at 2018, comparing that percentage change over the 11 years and uh, counting it as an annual average. And you can see darker red now. So this re represents a sort of larger decline in establishments than you've seen in terms of a decline in employment. All right, so annual wages, I'll, I'll uh, buzz through these graphs. I think what you do see in these graphs is that um, uh, certainly uh, the US and Minnesota have higher average wages than uh, than Wisconsin in the manufacturing sector. Their growth has been steady for both of them, but, but uh, slower than we would like to see. So here's the graph that I think is important. This is sort of the annual uh, percentage change in, uh, in uh, the annual wages in manufacturing in Wisconsin. Recall that the Federal Reserve, although they're not the greatest at it, would like inflation to be at 2%. It's been a little bit below that, but if you take a 2% target for inflation, you tack onto that about 1.5% for uh, productivity growth, or a little bit more. Our target for nominal uh, uh, wages, wage growth, which is what this is, would be 4%, right? So we've seen wages not growing as rapidly as we would like. In fact, it's a good thing inflation has been lower than 2%, otherwise we would be seeing no increase in real wages. It's been about 1.5% over this, uh, this time period. Um, and here's what that looks like again by county. You see some counties experiencing uh, much higher um, uh, wage growth uh, on average uh, than that uh, 4%, and then some, the lighter shades, are, uh, are down around that sort of 2%. So those are the counties that are experiencing very uh, little, to no growth in real wages, which is um, problematic. The tale of sort of two states again, looking at the seventh versus the ninth uh, district, and you can see that the uh, the ninth district has experienced a little bit better um, uh, wage growth, uh, but again, sort of uh, barely ever cracking that four percent mark that we would like to uh, that we would like to see. All right, so now something I want to spend a little bit of time uh, uh, talking about, um, it would be this idea of the location quotient. So let me explain this metric. I think this is sort of uh, really a useful idea that uh, it's produced. So it uh, takes the percentage of employ employment in manufacturing in the US, okay, which is now around, let's say 8%, and then it compares that to the uh, percentage of employment in manufacturing in the particular region that we're talking about. It calculates the ratio. So a ratio of one would obviously um, uh, represent a, a county, let's say, that has the same proportion of, of employment in manufacturing as in the US. 
So I like to think about this measure in the same way you think about you know, your own kind of investing. So I, so many people in here, like Steve was talking about retirement. Uh, he's probably thinking about you know, how much he has in the stock market at the moment. Should he be rebalanced into um, um, fixed income, you know, bonds? what that percentage is. We think about a portfolio, what's the right portfolio to be invested in. I think sometimes about employment for the same way. So what's the, what's the optimal balance of, of, of uh, employment in manufacturing versus in retail versus other sectors? I don't have an answer to what the optimal is, but I do know sort of we'd experience something similar to the rest of the economy, the US economy, if we were, had a similar portfolio. So if we were all ones. And uh, I get nervous sort of when you're uh, uh, above one only because sort of you're more exposed than to something. That might be great if it's a growing industry with high wages and rapidly growing wages uh, and experiencing an increase in demand. That might be great. It also might turn out to be bad if sort of the opposite is true. And here, what you see in, for Wisconsin is that we were, uh, you know, manufacturing dependent almost, almost twice what the, uh, the U.S. rate was. And we've become even more so over time. It always sort of makes me sort of wonder when I see policymakers um, uh, thinking about trying to attract particular jobs. They're like, we need more manufacturing in Wisconsin. And I think, like, I don't know that that's the case, right? I mean, we're already two times the national average, uh, and I'm not so sure that's the right portfolio balance. So, um, but one of the things we've seen here coming out of this uh, recession is that uh, Wisconsin has become even more manufacturing-based and dependent than it was uh, before. And here you can see that location quotient, right? So that plotted by county. Again, so that any counties that are sort of the lightest blue would be about once, or they're about the same as the, the national uh, um, average, or the national average in terms of employment percentage. And the dark blue ones would be um, as high as four, four times sort of the national uh, uh, average. And I think, you know, this separating this graph out in the way I have, I really had this preconception too that that the, uh, the ninth district would be very rural, and to me rural meant more ag uh, jobs, but also more manufacturing. Having grown up in the southeastern <coughs> part of uh, Wisconsin, I sort of didn't think about the level of manufacturing that we have. You can see that there are a lot of uh, counties that still in southeastern Wisconsin are, are heavily dependent upon uh, manufacturing. All right, so that was the, sorry, can I go back? Oh yeah, good. Um, so this is the location quotient by district, and you can see that the, the seventh district, that is the sort of southeastern part of Wisconsin, is even more dependent upon manufacturing. Seems like a good time to spend 30 times as much as you should on a subsidy to bribe a manufacturer located in Kenosha, right? <laughs> Public strategy. All right. Um, see, unlike my colleagues who all you know actually work for the state government, I sort of do, but I'm actually an academic economist with tenure, so I can't get fired. Um, <laughs> so I can say stuff like that. Anyhow, so um, this is the wage location quotient. So this is the same concept that I talked about before, but rather than sort of thinking about employment, we take total wages. So you know, uh, manufacturing in Wisconsin is uh, more uh, highly compensated than manufacturing in the rest of the country, and so our, our location quotient is even uh, a little bit uh, higher in those regards. All right. And I, I wanted to talk about robots. I saw Steve's presentation. I wanted to talk about the, the robots coming. Um, I'm out of time, sorry. <laughs> so thanks for bringing the energy, TJ and Steve. Uh, so we have a little bit less than 10 minutes for q and I, I will try to keep mine to one. So again, there's microphones around. Raise your hand so we can get the first one launched. Uh, but I'm going to ask the first question. Uh, Steve, maybe I'll start with you. And other presenters have suggested that foreign-born population increases is going to help uh, workforce growth. The thing I noticed is that Minnesota's growth in foreign-born is significantly higher than Wisconsin's is. Yes. And I'm wondering if you have any theories on why that is. There's, our economies are fairly similar. There's lots of similarities between um, our cultures and things of that nature. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas on why we are seeing stronger growth in Minnesota in foreign born than in Wisconsin. Right. Well, it, it, the interesting thing about a, a lot of immigration is that immigrants look for locations where they might have a cultural network or even family. And, and here in Minnesota, we've had uh, the, uh, you know, the benefit of that with respect to the, the Hmong and Southeast Asian immigrants in the, in the 70s and, and 80s and into the 90s then uh, through largely East African, uh, Somali, Ethiopian uh, and other uh, immigrants. So, you know, we, we have uh, a very high concentration 
it, it, it also of some of the West African countries, Liberia. Um, so you know, a, a lot of that is being uh, is is the result of that magnetic attraction that potential immigrants have to areas where they expect to see. Uh, you know, the networks and, and social community, cultural community. TJ, would you have anything to add to that? Um, I just say that the art immigrant population would be among, but you know, by now sort of, uh, there's not a lot of extra attractions, so most of them are third uh, generation at this point, so not foreign born. And, and I, you know, can I add, uh, you know, it, of course, it, it also uh, helps to have the perception if not the reality of a very strong uh, economy with low unemployment rates and, and you know, especially in the 90s, um, perhaps uh, decently, um, but you know, the, the perception is there's, a, there's the land of opportunity here that, that also um, intensifies that magnetism. Okay, thank you, question. Right back, right back there. Yeah, Thomas Paulson, a proud Minnesotan born Gopher, or Badger back in Minnesota. Um, I'm gonna ask a question that hopefully will allow you to draw from the arc of the total discussion today, which is um, what, are the, what are the alternatives or are, are there solutions? And so for example, can you bring broadband to the rural communities and can you get enough workers that are employed in the gig economy or in remote workers that it can make a difference that can be an offset, or is that just likely to be too small to ever make that big of a difference? Offset to, to worker shortage? No. Or manufacturing or employment? I mean, the, all, of, all of the structural issues that you address to other speakers address today in terms of the, you know, the rural Minnesota, rural Wisconsin, in terms of aging or in terms of lack of um, access to broadband or migrating uh, high school kids, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, uh, I, I know there are a lot of economists that, that, that work on this, and I think they have a lot of great ideas. To me, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more pessimistic. I think our, our best solution is probably, you know, lacrosse is in this unique area in that we are, uh, we're not sort of declining, we're, we're a regional hub. So I think what you'll see is population loss from sort of the really rural to the slightly less rural um, the you know the Rochesters and Lacrosses and things like that and that might be the the sort of the best hope. Uh, otherwise, I think it, it to keep people where they're currently located, given what I see as sort of the coming economics, will be an expensive proposition and it would require I think a substantial public investment, be it broadband, be it other sorts of retraining, be it in you know other forms of incentives to keep people located there, the doctors, the all the support that you might need for those positions. To be a downer. Yeah, no, I, 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 building on that, I, you know, there's probably as many uh, impediments to employment as there are people wishing they could take the next job that's made available to them. Uh, you know, but w it, it, it may be transportation or childcare for, for some individuals. In rural Minnesota, it may just be geographic uh, disconnect between where they live and where the jobs are. Uh, uh, efforts like broadband might be able to narrow that gap, but we have as many challenges to engaging the workers that we're going to so desperately need in, in the years ahead. Uh, I think we, we need to identify and, and enact steps to overcome all of those, including broadband, including transportation, childcare, and, and educational disparities. I would point out quickly, if you look at actually migration statistics, so the percentage of people in the county that came from a different county in the last year, it's down under about 10%, and it used to be more like 20%. So we have stopped moving, even though you sort of feel like it, we have stopped moving dramatically in this country. That has sort of, I think, slowed the vibrancy of labor markets down a little bit. But um, you know that would have to sort of slow even even more probably since most of it is you know in migration to cities. One more question. Hey, Jeremy Swinson here. Uh, thank you so much, Minneapolis Fed, for doing this. I want to give you a chance to talk more about the robots thing, but I want to tee it off with uh, some commentary. So, Amazon has a lot of distribution centers in the district, and they have these um, uh, simple robots that move packages and align them in rows for the uh, distribution. Um, out, out trucks, if you will. So that's one thing that I've, I've seen. Another thing is the drones. And I don't know the extent to which they're used, but I know for the rural areas, maybe in the UP, um, there might be a good use case there. Another question is, 
Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between a robot and AI? And I don't think we're quite at AI yet, but what have you seen in the manufacturing sector in terms of the difference between a robot and AI, and where do you think we'll be going in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of the research got its genesis with the, um, with trying to explain, you know, what's been turned the hollowing out of the middle class. A lot of that has to do with the, uh, 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 the automation of a lot of those factory floor types of jobs. The microchip process, you know, the microchip being brought to bear in, you know, those very routine tasks. We're looking at um, the kinds of technological advance here that goes well beyond that. You know, of just automating the the very routine, predictable uh, steps that a factory floor worker may have been going through 20 years ago. Uh, you know, with with pro the programming capacity, uh, big data, cloud services, computing. Uh, you know, all of those bring these daily examples of tasks that used to take a lot of cognitive power uh, are now being automated. Um, you know, dr drones, uh, in order to not only um, take out enemy <laughs> combatants or whatever, but also to, you know, deliver your package or your mail, uh, you know, we'll have to have a lot more ability to process spatial awareness information or, or what have you uh, in order to take on the tasks that, you know, I think we could easily envision them doing. But I think, you know, those kinds of things are certainly in the offing. I think it depends on the regulatory environment as to how fast some of these things, you know, uh, autonomous automobiles is a good example, you know. Obviously, the technology is very close, but I think uh, our regulatory environment um, has to catch up. TJ, any thoughts on that? And then one time for one more question. Yeah, I think, um, just real quickly, I, um, I, I think it's unambiguously good in the long run for our economy that you're you know, employing uh, equipment to do sort of work that we used to do. Um, I think the challenge is always with any of these things is the transition, right? Sort of the people who initially lose their job and how we help support them in finding other places to work. I don't believe in the lot of fallacy that their sort of jobs are gone forever. If they would, maybe we have a leisure society, and that's what we always sort of hope for, anyways, right? But um, I, I do think it, it's how we plot that transition, how we uh, have other wraparound services to support people that need to be reemployed in other sectors. Our final question. All right, I don't mean to be the last person here to hold you between leaving, but really quick, Sam Markin with the City of Faribault. We're largely dominated by manufacturing, and more specifically, advanced manufacturing. And I think locally, what we're seeing is as the automation is coming in, it's not eliminating jobs, it's just a different type of job. So my question is, in the climate that we're in, with a shortage in workforce, what can we be doing to elevate those existing workers, to retain them in the employment sector as this automation comes in for the manufacturers and we continue down that path? I, always, I was going to say, I, I always answer the labor shortage issue like an economist and say, pay them more. Um, it's not a popular answer by people who actually have to pay them. Um, but that's certainly one uh, yeah. solution to another. Yeah. I, you know, you've made, you've made a couple of points that I'd, I'd like to reiterate. First of all, you know, while manufacturing writ large is kind of one of those highly automatable industries, it, it's not the case that all sectors or, or industries within manufacturing, you know, uh, uh, electromedical device manufacturing is very different than food processing manufacturing, you know, and so on. So. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities within manufacturing, you know, to look at technology as a, an opportunity to enhance worker productivity and therefore wages and keep them, keep them uh, happy. Um, there was another point too, but I forgot. So. <laughs> Do we want to leave it on that note? Yeah, it seems like a perfect way to leave it. <laughs> perfect way. I, I usually end my day. Please help me. Thank you very much. Adjourning, uh, the bank just wants to extend a sincere thank you to Beth for our keynote, to all six of our state panelists who in some cases came from very great distance to join us here. We really appreciate the investment of time and energy in, pre in preparing your remarks, to bringing that to our audience, and we really just, can we give them another round of applause?